Ma'am, it will be ten minutes, ma'am. That will that will be managed by you people. Or I have to see. Ma'am, we will take care of ma'am that. Okay. Thank. You. Thank. You. Sir, we are uh, uh, on YouTube live now. I will start. Yeah, I, I got. You, got you can uh, start the process. Yeah. Good morning and a warm welcome to each and every one of you to this. Second National Web Conference on Advances in Teaching and Research in Veterinary Anatomy in India, being organized from the 16th to 18th of December 2021. We have successfully completed the day one and day two. The day one had the plenary lecture and the virtual tours, and the day two had the session awards for the assistant professors, for the MVSC scholars, and for the PhD scholars. We are here on day three in the forenoon session. We are happy to have you all, and this is the session which is open. That is a multidisciplinary session for presenters across various disciplines in veterinary science. The general guidelines have been given well in advance to all concerned. and uh, we have coded the presenters names the presenters are once again requested to ensure that uh, their screen name is coded uh, with the given code the code allotted to them you will be judged online as per the score sheet format that has been given to you there is slight reshuffling of the order that was given in the program schedule due to the several requests from the presenters uh, who are tied down with other uh, duties in their respective colleges so the order may not be right the judges uh, judging online may make note that the presenter who is presenting please take note of the opu presenter's code number and uh, judge according so we'll start the day's proceedings and uh, as per a request of uh, the reshuffled order we request the op presenter 4 to first uh, present his uh, presentation today you are all made co-host so you can directly share your screen and uh, make your presentation op presenter 4 sir good morning sir uh, this is op present 4 sir uh, trying to share my screen sir uh, can you please help me in, uh, because i am funny sharing the screen sir i'm trying to share the screen uh, sir am i audible you are audible but uh, your screen has not been shared those of for low connectivity i think you should ensure that you should have good connectivity and from there you should be presenting did you send us your powerpoint earlier we have requested because of network issues sir if anybody has an issue sharing the screen if you would have sent the powerpoint we would have shared the screen for you and you could have given the voice uh Sir, even uh, yesterday we had such there were little bit modification no it is uh, up to you some you should look into all done, those sir. can i send that now is it okay if i send it now sir you yes, can you can send it. 
you, you send can send it now okay, okay to the official department mailbox and uh, you will be called as and when uh, we find time you should wait for the shuffle uh, order if necessary will you be sending within a minute i'm sending it now sir Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity. And today, I am going to discuss about oxidosis in poultry. Uh, coccidiosis is one of the most important diseases of poultry and is characterized by hemorrhagic and necrotic enteritis. Chickens of all ages and breeds are susceptible to infection. Outbreaks are common between three to six weeks of age and are rarely seen in poultry flocks of less than three weeks. It is caused by protozoan parasite belonging to the subclass coccidia and family amiridae, uh, developing with the within the intestine of most domestic and the wild animals and the birds. Uh, seven species of Imeria, uh, they are Imeria acervulina, Brunetti, Maxima, Mitis, Nacatrix, and Precox, and Tenella. Uh, these are recognized as uh, infecting chickens. Uh, the present aim of this study is to evaluate the clinical gross and histopathological changes in poultry uh, diagnosed from coccidiosis infection that were presented to Department of Veterinary Pathology. Uh, a total of uh, in the year 2021. A total of a total of a total of three ninety five birds were presented for necropsy from both organized farms and backyard chickens. Out of which one point nine birds were positive for coccidium. Uh, out of these birds, uh, which were showing bloody mucoid diarrhea, uh, are clinically examined and the symptoms, morbidity, and the mortality were recorded. And the postmortem examination was conducted, and the gross lesions were also recorded. For histopathological changes, the tissues from uh, respective intestine, cecum, with lesions were collected and fixed in 10% formal saline solution for further processing. Uh, coming to the results, 
uh, affective birth showed depression, anorexia, bloody mucoid diarrhea. Out of 129 births, 109 births died due to intestinal coccidiosis caused by Imerian ecatrix brunetti and 20 were with cecal coccidiosis caused by Imeria tenella. Uh, the principal lesions were found in the small intestine and the cecal. Small white opaque foci were found. And the mucosal surface revealed severe hemorrhages. The intestines were extremely balloon and petechial hemorrhages could be easily seen by looking grossly without opening the gut and on the mucous membrane of intestine when open. And the intestinal lumen was filled with blood mixed content. Uh, intestinal wall was edematous, thickened, showing necrosis and sloughing of the intestinal epithelium. And the coccidiosis was ascertained through demonstration of osis in mucosal scraping of intestine and cecal and also in the feces. Uh, histopathologically, uh, there is uh, the changes observed were loss of epithelial tissue from the intestinal mucosa and congestion of blood vessels, which indicate disruption followed by hemorrhage, severe muscular edema, necrosis of submucosa of intestine and cecum. Uh, there was loss of intestinal villi, disruption of cecal mucosa, and clusters of oozes were seen. Uh, there was massive infiltration of heterophils and mononuclear cells. Uh, several mirojoys, shijons, and mi microgametes were found in the epithelial cells. Uh, pictorially, uh, there is a pale breast and hemorrhagic content in the intestinal lumen. And here we can see the ballooning of intestine. Uh, here we can see petechial hemorrhages and the necrotic foci in the, on the serosa of intestine. Um, Histopathologically, uh, there is disintegration of villi and the presence of uh, different stages of coccidia. Uh, we can see uh, mirojoids in the submucosa of the intestine and a cluster of large shijons and heterophyll infiltration in the intestinal submucosa. Here we can see congestion uh, in the villi and numerous shijons in the mucosa of intestine and degeneration of the epithelium of villi. Uh, here we can see the uh, sloughing of the intestinal villi and presence of different stages of coccidium in the villi and the epithelial cells. Uh, I'll coming to discussion. Uh, an excessive no. amount of... Uh, uh, While coming to discussion, an excessive amount of blood is retained in the tissue as well as to ballooning like appearance of the intestine due to hemotaxis of white blood cells combined with edema. This result agreed with L. Nagar, who mentioned that inflammation such as hyperemia and edema in the affected birds. Uh, microscopical results of the infected birds showed there were severe hemorrhages because of congestion of the blood vessels leading to disruption. And this result agreed with Sharma et al. Uh, and the microscopical study uh, showed visible developmental stages of imeria and the villus of epith epithelial villi. And this uh, result agreed with the Amer et al. 2010, uh, who revealed that the detection of uh, de develop different developmental stages of imeria in duodenum, mid intestine, and cecum. While coming to conclusion, uh, the clinical signs observed include greenish, yellowish, and brown bloody stool. Inactivity of feet, weight loss, huddling, drop in feed intake, drop in production, emaciation, comb, and battles of tail, anemic and sudden death. Uh, gross lesions uh, of the intestine include uh, balloon and hemorrhagic intestine. Uh, While well, histopathologically, there is loss of epithelial tissue, congestion of blood vessels, and severe mucosal edema, necrosis of the submucosa, loss of villi, and marked hemorrhages, and the presence of uh, Oocysts within the intestinal villi and different stages of imeria. Uh, by these clinical signs, gross histopathological examination, uh, and we can see we can diagnose uh, the case. The, these cases were of coccidiosis. Thank you.
I hope the chairperson and the reporter are uh, logged in. I hope the chairperson and reporter are logged in. Okay, it is open for anyone to ask a question or as we have requested, you could have posted in your uh, Zoom chat box or for the viewers who are viewing in YouTube, the questions will be picked up by my co-host, Dr. Tomer from the YouTube chat box if there are any questions. The reporter, if uh, he is online, can pick up the questions from the Zoom chat box. And also it is open for anyone to unmute themselves and ask any question with respect to OP presenter one. Chairperson and reporter are online. Okay, maybe most of them are having their uh, network issues. Hello. OP, any OP question per from any person? Oh, sir. Yes. I have one, one question. Okay, sir. You have told that there is an incidence of different species of media. Yes, sir. How did you identify these species? Uh, for morphological morphology, we did micrometry of the coccidial oocyte cell. Only that method was used. Uh, yes. Right. Thanks. Okay, thank you, OP presenter sir, one. There is uh, can, uh, uh, any question? Sir, am I audible, sir? Raja, sir. Uh, Raja, you are the reporter. Yes, you sir. Are, yes, sir. Uh, are disconnected twice or thrice by now. Sir, net connection, sir. Some audio problem uh, is there. So I... Okay, okay. If you are there, you can uh, continue. Okay, yes, OP sir. presenter one, thank you. Oh, you can thanks. log out. Yes. And OP presenter two is uh, ready. OP presenter two. OP presenter three is ready. OP presenter three. Yeah, you can uh, share your screen and start your presentation. OP presenter three. Okay, sir. Raja. Sir. Yeah, kindly note. OP presenter yes, one has completed. Now yes, sir, it is yes, OP presenter three. Okay, sir. Okay. We'll see whether OP presenter three can uh, really share the screen and start the presentation or not. Okay. Sir, please share OP presenter three. Please share your uh, uh, PowerPoint. OP presenter three, are you there? OP presenter three. OP presenter 4 is available. OP. OP presenter 4. Okay, 3 has sir, started. 3 has started, sir. 3 okay. started. Okay, okay. It's a session, sir. My presentation. Good morning to one and all. So my uh, presentation is on uh, a note on histological alterations caused by parasites in the in and the Okay. Sir, is my PPT visible, sir? Visible, Your visible. PPT is visible now. Please share uh, full screen. Audio, audio is not clear. Now, visible. 
sir is my voice is audible sir some disturbance is there why sir your voice is some disturbance but, but please go ahead please start please start नेटवर्क इश्यू फ्रॉम हर साइड Sir, uh, we'll ask uh, uh, OP presenter four to present, sir, if he is available. Yeah, OP presenter four, are you ready? OP presenter four. Please respond. OP presenter four is available. Op presenter five is available. Five. Yes, sir. Myself is available. Okay. Op presenter five, please uh, share your screen and start. Okay, I, I can try, sir. Chair person, reporter, and uh, judges, please note. no kindly be listening to our instructions if you have been skipped you have to wait for your time we have now requested op presenter 5 she only should share he or she only should share the screen sir uh, it has been uh, coming only one host can share its screen someone that is what other i am is... saying uh, when we have someone announced someone other is and... also sharing when we have announced a new number the old person should stop sharing the old person is having connectivity issues we can't waste time so others please uh, don't share only op presenter 5 share your screen i think uh, dr nagamaleshwari chairperson and dr raja reporter you are logged in now you can take over till now only op presenter 1 has presented all others are having connectivity issues and we requested op presenter 5 op presenter 5 i am trying sir sir yes, sir are you able to see me yes ma'am yes ma'am finally uh, could get into uh is it um uh, is it visible see the problem with all of you is uh, if you don't have good net connectivity we can't do anything we are running out of time and uh, once we come to 11 am we'll close the session because we have the lead paper session from then on all of them have asked for a dedicated slot for their lead paper we cannot postpone that so if you are able to present you present if you have network issues we can't do Sir, I have received uh, presentation from OP presenter four, sir. If you permit okay. me, I will share from my side yes, and uh, yes, the yes, person will yes, present, sir. Is OP presenter four ready to give voice? OP presenter four. Yes, sir, yeah, yeah, I am there, sir. I am here. Ah, uh, okay. Dr. Thomar, you share OP presenter four's uh, presentation and OP yes. presenter four, you give your voice as per the slides. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. For information of all, yesterday also we had such problem. We did this way. Okay. Nigga, is it OP presenter four? Ah, uh, yes, yes, sir. Yeah, judges, uh, chairperson, and report yes, here uh, kindly notice that till now we have completed only OP presenter uh, one, no, no. and now it is OP presenter four. Kindly start, sir. Yeah. Uh, can I start, sir? Yes, sir. Please start, sir. Please start. Uh, a very good morning to the organizers and the chairman and the rapporteur. I'm glad I have got, I have this opportunity to 
share my presentation on FHC evaluation of phytogenic formulation in broilers through scanning electron microscopy analysis and intestinal morphometry of small intestines. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the importance of this uh, uh, feeding of antibiotic growth promoters that we all know that how uh, important the meat consumption is that. So by it is uh, around the world that uh, the meat consumption is increasing day by day. And in fact, uh, the meat consumption and the meat uh, from the poultry uh, is increasing day by day. So there is a greater need for uh, the meat to be produced effectively and quality meat need to be produced. To feed uh, 10 billion people by 2050, it is important to have good animals which can produce a good quality meat. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, see that uh, we know that uh, see, uh, the poultry meat has been increasing in, in the United States, it's more than 40. And in Australia, it is around 40. And so like that, even in India, uh, though it has not been depicted in this uh, uh, graph, but in, in India also the poultry meat uh, is taking a good shape and uh, it, is, it is highly valuable uh, meat consumption in, in, in India also. Next slide, please. Yeah, the chicken, it provides vitamins, minerals involved in brain function. It contains nutrients linked with food and uh, very easy to eat, aids in weight loss. It promotes heart health and build muscle. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, please. Excuse me, next slide. Uh, so the feeding of the participants, please. Please, 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 please mute your mics. Please mute your mics. Dr. Praveen, Everybody, Dr. please mute yourself. Accept the presenter. Previous slide, previous slide. Yeah. So uh, the importance of meat and the importance of probiotics. So the probiotics. So the, these are the alternative to antibiotics because antibiotics is creating a havoc uh, and uh, meat consumption and they are leaving some residues and it is not safe to consume. So uh, nowadays the industry has moved on from pro antibiotics to probiotics. This probiotics is, we know that it increases the nutrition uh, nutrient absorption, it increases the number of IgA and B cells, reduces inflammation and improves antioxidant indexes and it en enhances the mucosa and Im immunity. And it also modulates the expression of inflammatory cytokines. Next slide, please. So keeping in view of these uh, probiotics and the importance of the meat, uh, we have formulated to study the efficacy of probiotics and antibiotics. So please wait a minute. And also to study the efficacy of probiotics through uh, scanning electron microscopy and intestinal morphometry and serum biochemistry, carcosterides and fluid conversion uh, efficiency. And next. Next slide, please. Well, uh, we have all, uh, uh, planned the study like this. We have taken 210 chicks, they old chicks, and we have uh, divided them into seven groups and 30 in each group and uh, having a 10 in, and made it, them into bio, uh, biological triplicates. And we in each triplicate, we have kept 10 birds. And we, uh, seen, we have grown them for six weeks and in each group, uh, uh, the groups are divided into T0 control and T1, we have given amoxicillin, T2, the antibiotic, uh, that is a probiotic, and T3, T3 we have given ciprofloxacin, T4, uh, neoxy and deoxycycline, and T5, we have given oxytetracycline, and T6 is T amylin, we have given. And we studied for six weeks. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Uh, then uh, we, after six weeks, we have seen in the, we have uh, studied the serum biochemistry. Uh, we see in serum biochemistry, we have seen total protein, albumin, glucose, SGPT, calcium, and phosphorus. And at the same time, we have seen the field conversion efficiency and field conversion ratio. And uh, uh, through to understand better whether the antibiotics they are giving better absorption or not uh, we went for intestinal morphometry to and also scanning electron microscopy to see the uh, jejunum and to see the ileal walls how the width of the ileum and uh, 
uh, jejunum. Please, next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. And then observation and data analysis. And we see in the, the carcass strikes, uh, we, can, uh, we can appreciate the uh, a significant difference in the uh, and biotic feed group. Uh, that is, uh, uh, we can see there is a significant, and of course, uh, we also found some uh, uh, significant difference with amoxicillin, but in other uh, parameters that where we check amoxicillin is not that significant. But however, uh, and biotic has shown certain, uh, in, uh, certain significant uh, uh, parameter in significance in different parameters. So, uh, we felt that carcass characteristics, yes, antibiotic is uh, significantly different when, when compared to other groups. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And then uh, we have also seen the feed conversion ratio uh, in the T2 group, which is uh, where we have fed probiotic. There, uh, there is a significant difference of F, uh, FCR. The FCR is low. That means it, the feed conversion efficiency is more. And then we thought that, yeah, T2 showing a significant difference in FCR among other groups. And next group. Next slide, please. Well, in serum biochemistry, uh, we've seen that total protein and albumin, they have shown a significant difference in the T2, this uh, uh, N-biotic group, that probiotic fed group. Next slide, please. Well, uh, the same thing in the albumin and globulin total protein, uh, this uh, probiotic fed group has shown a significant difference. At the same time, in glucose levels and in cholesterol and calcium phosphorus also, uh, this has shown a significant difference. Uh, of course, uh, there is an, another group uh, also has shown a significant difference, that is amoxicillin fed group also has shown a significant difference, as I said earlier. But though this amoxicillin has not shown uh, that much significance, when compared to the antibiotic. Next. Next. Well, the SGPT levels uh, in T2, that uh, probiotic fed group is also uh, higher when compared to other groups. Uh, next slide, please. Well, uh, this is the findings that we wanted to see uh, again. Uh, the scanning electron microscopy analysis of film and jejunum, and we've seen that uh, in uh, antibiotic there is a significant uh, uh, increase in the genome height and uh, also in, in antibiotic. At the same time, amoxicillin has also shown that significance. But since this is an antibiotic, uh, uh, we not we are not uh, 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 giving our chance or giving our word to on the amoxicillin, but we are continued with the antibiotic, the probiotic part. Next slide. So these are the pictures of uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy of villi of jejunum, where you can see uh, the difference in the villi and villi width also, there is a significant difference in crypt width also. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the pen, uh, I mean, uh, the, to show the highlighter to show where is the significant increase, but I can understand that uh, I assume that you can understand this by pictures. Next. Uh, presenter, slide, kindly try to, uh, sorry, I'm interrupting, kindly try to conclude. The chairperson and reporter also kindly note that we have to conclude yes. the session by 11 a.m. I'm afraid uh, yeah, yeah, we'll be late. Uh, so you, don't uh, give the to, liberal uh, seven to, or eight to, minutes also. Uh, you have to finish within five minutes, question and answer within two minutes. Chairperson and report here. Sir, uh, and two minutes or ten minutes is the present. Uh, we have seen there was a significant difference in the uh, villi of the ileum also and in the scanning electron microscope images. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, intestine and morphometry also has shown a significant difference. Of course, it is not that uh, the images were not that clear as scanning electron microscope. And in summary, uh, we have multidisciplinary uh, work we have done. And we have taken the poultry signs and uh, the chicks and we are fed with, uh, and with the help of animal nutrition. We have seen the feed conversion efficiency. And with the help of biochemistry, we have seen serum biochemistry and with the help of veterinary anatomy. We have seen the pictures of the scanning electron microscope and interstitial morphometry analysis. So this is the multidisciplinary work. And I thank you, the organizers, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present this work. Thank you. And I also acknowledge 
Uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, antibiotic, the probiotics were given, have shown a significant difference among the antibiotics. So uh, probiotics can be the replacers for the antibiotics. I acknowledge Ayurved Buddy Himachal Pradesh for funding this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, presenter number four, for your good presentation and good analysis. Then uh, yes, anybody please. have the questions regarding this? Yeah, yeah, there's a question, there's a question. Now, this topic is open for, open for debate. Anybody are having okay, questions for this? Yes, yes, I, I'm having one question. Yes, sir, please, sir. Proceed. Uh, okay, Presenter, for you have shown that there's an increase in the SGPT in your yes, slides. Sir. Yes, sir, yes, yes. And it indicates the liver and the cardiac damage. Yes, sir. Right, he said. Uh, that's what, uh, yeah. You how, right, how, how, how you justify the beneficial effect of your antibiotic in the light of the increased SGPT. Yes, sir, rightly pointed out, sir. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, that not much significant is there, uh, improvement is there, I mean, increase is there. It is a slight increase when compared to other antibiotics, but whatever the results have shown, uh, uh, we have shown it uh, because uh, in other uh, parameters like other serum biochemical parameters and SEM analysis and feed conversion efficiency and ratio, uh, this probiotic has shown a significant difference. Yes, as you pointed out, uh, there is a little bit of uh, SGPT increases there. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I have, have a question. I, I have one question, sir. Yes, Hello? Kumar, yes. Madam, yes. please proceed. Yes, yes. Now, uh, okay. why you have taken only ilium and jejunum, isn't it? Uh, so, why you, why you left out diodinum? Any specific <laughs> reason is there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Uh, we, in fact, we have taken duodenum, jejunum, and ileum three. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, duodenum uh, got spoiled uh, while we, the processing is taking place. So we were not able to do that, ma'am. Uh, we felt for sorry for that. Okay. Another another question is there. Another question is also okay, there. Can we, I ask? Okay. Respected chairperson and uh, reporter, uh, presenters, and everyone over here. We are constrained with time due to the connectivity issue from many of you. We have lost time. I cannot compromise on the lead paper session, which is due to start from 11 o'clock. So kindly see that uh, questions are there in the chat box. The presenters pick up and they can answer later. And I request the chairperson and the reporter to see that only five minutes is given for presentation. And only maximum of around two questions are allowed uh, during question and answer session. We need to proceed to the other presenters and okay. uh, uh, kindly cooperate because the lead paper session presenters are all ready and there is a lot of reshuffling at their request. We have to oblige so many things. So I think earlier we have asked three and five OP presenters also. They could not. Uh, OP presenter two is ready. No. no. OP presenter six is ready. You have to respond quickly. OP presenter 7 is ready. Yes, sir. I am ready, sir. Yeah, you go ahead. Chairperson and reporter and judges, please note. 1, 4, over, and now 7. Third present. Sir, I need uh, share screen uh, enabling, sir. I'm already, I made you co-host, ma'am. Please okay. share. Okay, thank you, thank you. Sir. Please share, please. Good morning, everyone. I am OP Presenter 7, and I am uh, here to present uh, a research paper on metastatic mammary tumors in dogs. Mammary tumors are one of the most common neoplasms, accounting for approximately 50% of all tumors in female dogs. And all malignant canine mammary tumors have the potential to metastasize, and in general, metastasis tends to occur via the lymphatic system and uh, through blood to lungs and to lymph nodes. Uh, especially distant body sites like liver, spleen, heart, and bone are mostly involved. And p53 gene mutations are the most common genetic alterations involved in tumor regenesis and thereby metastasis among various species. And the majority of p53 gene mutations are clustered in domains localized between exons 4 to 8 called hotspots. With this background, the objectives of my study are to determine the sites of metastasis using lymph node cytology, radiography, necropsy in possible cases, and histopathology to estimate the rate of metastasis in different types of canine mammary tumors to determine canine P53 gene alterations in the metastatic canine mammary tumors if there are any. 
and coming to the materials, a total of 72 uh, tumor cases were included in the study. Of these, uh, two dogs died during the study period and were subjected to necropsy. All the tumor tissue samples were thoroughly examined grossly and were preserved for uh, histopathological analysis. And uh, at min minus 20 degrees centigrade, they were stored for molecular studies. The methods employed were lymph node cytology, radiography, histopathology, and uh, molecular studies, which included DNA isolation from canine mammary tumors, PCR for amplification of exons 4 to 8 of uh, canine P53 gene, and gene sequencing of the PCR products. Coming to the results, in the present study, out of 72 tumor cases, metastasis was recorded in 13 cases, and the forms of metastasis were lymphatic vascular invasion, regional lymph node metastasis, and distant metastasis. So this is a table uh, showing the different histological types of canine mammary tumors that have undergone metastasis, uh, which included complex carcinoma, intraductal papillary carcinoma, solid carcinoma, anaplastic carcinoma, carcinosarcoma, tubular carcinoma, carcinoma and malignant myoepithelioma, mucinous carcinoma, and micropapillary invasive carcinoma. Of all the histological types, my micropapillary invasive carcinoma had the highest rate of metastasis. And of all the sites, uh, regional lymph node metastasis uh, uh, was the one which had highest uh, 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 metastasis. And these are the gross pictures of uh, canine mammary tumors that have undergone metastasis. And uh, these are the, uh, I mean, I'm going to show you the uh, different uh, histological types that have undergone metastasis. The first one is a complex carcinoma, where uh, we can see that uh, the myo myoepithelial part is a benign one and the epithelial part is a carcinomatous. The second one is intraductal carcinoma, where the carcinomatous part has taken up uh, papillary projections, and uh, the solid carcinoma, which shows uh, sheets of neoplastic cells. And uh, the fourth one is anaplastic carcinoma, wherein we can see uh, anaplastic cells with uh, a high degree of pleomorphism. And uh, the fifth one is a carcinosarcoma, where we can see that both the epithelial and mesenchymal part are both uh, uh, malignant. The tubular carcinoma, where uh, the neoplastic cells have taken up uh, the, or uh, they form the tubules. And the seventh one is uh, carcinoma and malignant myopathy. Audio, audio is not coming. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Audio, audio is not coming. Hello, Does am it... I audible? Yeah, now no. only it's audible. From the beginning, ma'am? I think previous slide, we, we have to go first. You can proceed, ma'am. Last is look two slides. Last two slides. Actually, my screen is not moving. Okay, I'll just proceed. Uh, oh, the, the, these are uh, uh, the two tumors of uh, mucinous carcinoma, where uh, we can see uh, the mucin secretion. And uh, the other one is the micropapillary invasive carcinoma, where the neoplastic uh, cells have taken the form of micropapillae. My screen is not moving. <laughs> so uh, these are the yeah, other... Screen. Shall I continue, ma'am? Yeah, you can continue. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. So uh, these are the other types of uh, canine mammary tumors, the carcinosarcoma, where uh, both the epithelial and mesenchymal parts are uh, malignant, the tubular carcinoma, where the, uh, where the neoplastic epithelial cells have formed the tubules. Uh, this is the carcinoma and malignant epithelioma, where both uh, the epithelial and myoepithelial part are malignant. And uh, uh, these are the different uh, tumors, the complex carcinoma, where... Uh, the myoepithelial part is uh, benign and the uh, epithelial part is carcinomatous. And the uh, intraductal carcinoma, where uh, the carcinomatous uh, uh, part has taken up uh, the form of papillae. The solid carcinoma, where we can see sheets of uh, neoplastic cells. And anaplastic carcinoma, where uh, the uh, neoplastic epithelial cells are highly pleomorphic. And uh, coming to the uh, types of metastasis, the first one is the lymphatic vascular invasion. In this picture, we can see uh, the neoplastic uh, emboli uh, in an anaplastic carcinoma, the neoplastic emboli uh, in a, a lymphatic vessel. So this is another type of metastasis that is regional lymph node metastasis. The first picture, you can see the cut section showing uh, of an inguinal lymph node showing brownish discoloration. The second one is a fine needle aspiration cytology of a lymph node showing uh, neoplastic mammary epithelial cells emidist uh, 
a large number of lymphocytes. And the third one is uh, the histopathology of a lymph node showing uh, a metastatic foci of neoplastic mammary epithelial cells in the sinuses of the lymph nodes. And uh, this is another type of metastasis that is distant metastasis into lungs. Here we can see a radio radiograph showing nodular pattern of metastasis in the lung. And uh, the uh, one of the dogs uh, have died during the st study. And uh, uh, we can uh, see that the metastatic uh, nodule is present in the uh, right lung parenchyma. And the, this is the histopathological section of the lung showing the metastatic uh, canine mammary tumor nodule. Presenter, kindly try to conclude. Okay, sir. Thank you. And uh, these are again uh, uh, types of distant metastasis into liver and pancreas, where we can see nodular pattern of uh, metastasis. And uh, these are the histopathological uh, structures uh, uh, of uh, liver and uh, pancreas showing uh, metastatic nodules composed of uh, ductular structures. And PCR was performed for exons 4 to 8 of P53 gene. And uh, this is the agile electrophoresis of the PCR products from exon 4 to 8. And uh, the PCR products were uh, subjected to DNA sequencing and the chromatograms were, com uh, were compared with that of the normal uh, P53 gene. Uh, two mammary tumor tissues showed mutations in exon 4, while the majority of the sequences were monomorphic with no sequence variation in the exon studied. So these are the uh, mutations at uh, six, uh, codon 61 and uh, 69 of a tumor. While uh, this is uh, another mutation at codon 88 of Please another tumor. Yes, ma'am. So we found the two missense mutations and a silent mutation in two canine mammary tumors. So in the present study, metastasis uh, was recorded in 18% of the cases and highest rates of metastasis were recorded in micropapillary invasive carcinoma. The sites of metastasis were lymph nodes, lungs, liver and pancreas and two metastatic tumors showed three types of gene mutations in exon 4 at codon 61, 69 and 88. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your Presentation, presenter number seven. And now this presentation is open for debate. Anybody are having questions or not to? Ma'am, there are no questions in the chat box, ma'am. I think, yeah, the chat box, no questions I have seen. Yeah. yeah. Anybody wants to ask any question to the presenter? No, thank you. The next presenter who is available here, number five is available. Presenter five. Presenter two. Presenter three. Yes, madam. Available, ma I'm ready, madam. Ready Presenter present three. Yeah, are you ready for presentation? Yes, madam. Okay, you can proceed now. Please enable me uh, as a co-host, madam, to share the PPT. Yeah, Tom, Tomar, please help him help her out. Dr. Tomar, are you there? Ma'am, better we'll, uh, uh, we'll ask 8, 9, 10, ma'am. Presenter 8, ma'am. Nagamali Shiram. Okay, kindly proceed to the next presenter available. Uh, I'll request the co host to make OP presenter 3. Yeah, any, any presenter number 7, presenter number 8? 8, eight 9, 10, ma'am. 8 is available? I don't think so. Here, then 5 is uh, uh, yeah, uh, but five we are unable to share our screen. Tomar? Yeah. Hmm. also not responding. Call him. OP presenter eight. OP presenter seven is co host. Finished. OP presenter it's three. Seven is over already. OP presenter three is ready, sir, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, wait. Two. Just wait. Just wait. Hold just on. Wait. Thank <laughs> you. 
Any other presenters? Uh, present nine, uh, OP presenter nine, I'm ready, sir. Yeah, can you try uh, your, in your network? Uh, ma'am, uh, I'm also not made the co-host, ma'am. Okay, okay, just do it then. We'll find out from... Where is this man? Ito, sir, he's not in the department. <laughs> I'm trying to contact him. He is not lifting yeah. the phone. Actually, we are working from home due to poor connectivity. Are facing college. problem. Can you help them out for presenter five, presenter three, and presenter nine? Are ready to? Uh, Ma'am, we are, are ready, ready, but we are unable to share our screen. Yeah. Yeah. Then you try now one, uh, three. Otherwise. Yeah, OP5 is ready, ma? Yeah, he made you all the OP presenter 3. Okay, ma okay. OP5 OP OP is ready, but we are unable yeah. to share our screen. You check your internet connection first. No, no, no. Ma we have OP5 actually. Host disabled no, 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 they are screen sharing. Please, please note down. In participants, we have two OP5. In participant, two OP5. Yes, ma'am. Okay, but, OP uh, presenter three, kindly share you your try screen. for three or nine. Sir, but he is not... Uh, you got three? Make make as co-host. Ma'am, you are co-host. Ma'am, 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 Host has disabled participant to share the screen. It's coming on the screen. Ma'am, we are having two OP5. Actually, we don't know which one is real and which one is uh, not real. Uh, myself. Uh... Okay, I got uh, your uh, voice is coming, ma'am. I will make you co-host. Okay. Ma'am, now you can share your, your screen, ma'am. Okay. Participants are requested to keep their respective name correctly to avoid confusion. And some of you are logging with the two gadgets with the same screen name. It is causing confusion. Please don't do that. Is it coming, sir? Yes, yeah, sir. please go ahead. Only five minutes you have to conclude. Okay. Chairperson um, and reporter, please note. Five minutes you have to conclude. Okay, My okay. topic is histomorphological and histochemical studies on the adrenal gland of the adult Bakarwali goat. Goat is the one of the oldest domestic animal and uh, it is also called as the poor man's cow. Bakarwali goats, they are very specific and migratory type of the animals. As these animals, they move downward to the plain areas in the end of the September and in the first week of the October. Then they come back to the hills in the ending March and the first week of the April. So they have to uh, travel a long distance and due to their migratory behavior, they come under the stress and the adrenal gland, they play a very important role in the maintenance of the stress uh, by secreting the different hormones. So adrenal glands in the Bakar Valley goat, they are the paired organs located within the abdominal cavity. And in the cross section adrenal gland, it comprised of the medulla in the center and cortex in the periphery, that too covered by the capsule. Adrenal cortex, it constitute about 90% of the total gland mass in this animal. And it is divided into three zones, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata and reticularis. Uh, uh, the study was conducted on the adrenal glands of the 50 apparently healthy adult Bakarwali goats, irrespective of the sex, and the samples were they were collected from the slaughterhouse. Uh, these Madam, are you just uh, say the, your results first. Okay, what are the differences between the Bakarwali and other goats? Do you, if you find anything, you just narrate all those stuff. Yes, ma'am. The adrenal glands. Glands, they were paired right and left and uh, 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 right adrenal gland. It lies in con uh, contact with the anterior medial part of the right kidney and occupied a uh, part of the renal impression uh, as it is uh, uh, evident on the also on the liver. 
it was pyramidal in shape and left adrenal gland was not in contact with the kidney but it lies near to the medial aspect of the corresponding kidney and left adrenal gland was strongly curved and elongated and it is significantly bigger as compared to the right one these are the parameters that shows that the um left one was uh, 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 significantly uh, bigger in the length as well as in the width the histo histological results they showed that it comprised of the stroma and the parenchyma and uh, parenchyma consists of the outer adrenal cortex and inner the uh, inner medulla uh, they comprised of the three zones uh, zona glomerulosa was the smallest zone of the adrenal cortex lying just below the adrenal capsule and uh, in case of the bakarwali goat it was reported that it has a superficial zona glomerulosa which shows the arrangement of the cells in a typical follicular and irregular cords and the deep in which the cells were irregularly arranged in the uh, uh, cords then the cells were columnar in shape and arranged uh, arranged in the irregular cords uh, few cells of the zona glomerulosa were found encapsulated within the trabeculae of the adrenal gland which comes from uh, descends into the parenchyma through the capsule and similar type of the arrangement was also seen that is the extra capsular zona fasciculata it was the broadest zone that occupies uh, uh, 55 to 54 to 55 percent of the total uh, uh, cortical area and uh, the area occupied uh, by the zona fasciculata that was bigger in the left one as compared to the right one the rest arrangement of the cells they were uh, arranged in the cords they are separated by the sinusoids then the zona reticularis this one the, uh, is the innermost zone of the adrenal cortex and cells were arranged in the cords that project in the different directions uh, arranging themselves as a anastomosing cords and the plates that are also separated by the large sinusoids the cytoplasmas eosinophilic and nuclei were they are basophilic and they are separated or uh, uh, encapsulated by the collagen and the reticular fibers mild to moderate activity was react, uh, seen by the carbohydrates found lipids and the cholesterol please, in please the conclude quickly yes, please sir. conclude quickly please in the micrometry we like... have seen that the uh, the cell size of the uh, different layers of the uh, adrenal cortex and the uh, were they were the size were bigger in the left uh, adrenal gland as compared to the right one and the difference was significantly more similarly the density of the cells per field in the adrenal cortex they, that was also reported more dense please, please go to your last slide we have to give opportunity to all please go please to your uh, final slide uh, the uh, actually all the activities they were uh, reported more in the left adrenal gland as compared to the uh, uh, right one the all the uh, histochemical uh, reactivity they were almost similar in the two glands and uh, the in the conclusion it was concluded that the left adrenal gland in the bakarwali goat was slightly bigger and uh, they have all the parameters in the on the higher side thank you sir these are the different slides encapsulated area of the adrenal cortex okay thank you thank you thank you, thank you. and i think uh, questions can be posed and uh, they can be answered by the presenter any one question sir. from the senior members is allowed otherwise We'll go to the next presenter. Sir, there is One. there are no questions in the chat box, sir, right now. Uh, okay, thank you. Is sir. there any questions? Okay, is there you. any questions? Thank you, Mr. Presenter. Uh, yeah, there's, there's one question. Okay, please log out. Yeah, somebody are having some question. I think. Yeah, yeah. One, yeah, one just question. I, just I wanted yeah, to know was there any difference in the all morphologic morphological uh, parameters as compared to the already reported uh, parameters in uh, Uh, yes sir yes sir the left adrenal gland was much bigger uh, uh, as compared to the other available data uh, in uh, irrespective of the any species okay. ma'am i yes. want to ask one thing one more what is the significance no, no, no. please please tomar dr tomar please no need of questions we we don't have time we have to give time to presenters at least for presentation i request you all please we'll stop thank this you thank you very much for your presentation and to history presenter 3 ma has to be given opportunity now yeah, yes, presenter 3 is ready sir yeah yeah please
presenter 3 please restrict to your time that is 5, five minutes, minutes for presentation and proceed not 5 minutes within 3 4 minutes all Last presenters time. are requested to keep your ppt open don't wait for that your turn will come and then only will open the file you keep your files ready good morning everybody i am presenter 3 and my topic is on a note on histomorphological alterations caused by parasites in slaughter pigs in and around krishna district andhra pradesh and coming to the introduction pigs are mainly raised by the poor farmers and uh, it is going to giving the, the um, uh, great uh, economic importance because of high fecundity and uh, uh, better feed conversion ratio and short generation intervals and keeping in view uh, so uh, these are mainly raised by the semi intensive system and free range system so that's why the parasitic burden is more so uh, my objectives was designed like uh, to know the actual status of parasitic diseases and so we can uh, uh, formulate the future uh, challenges to combat these pa parasitic diseases so we had collected the samples uh, from the local slaughter houses in and around krishna district andhra pradesh and uh, uh, some of the samples was collected from department of pathology and livestock product technology and dr cvsc gannavara so then coming to the methodology the methodology uh, we had collected the samples and uh, the respective samples was processed for the histopathological uh, uh, alterations and uh, these are the results we had uh, uh, concluded and we had uh, identified some of the gastrointestinal parasites tissue parasites and ectoparasites and coming to the individual descriptions and uh, the, these are the ascarid worms uh, you was uh, seeing on the screen and the intestinal lumen is completely obliterated with this uh, ascarid worm and uh, uh, the mainly uh, during migration part the larval stages migrated to the liver parenchyma which is going to forming the white spots so these white spots is nothing but form a accumulation of the lymphocytes and uh, the next picture you are seeing here is uh, the infilt infiltration of the mononucleus in the liver parenchyma and uh, this is another picture showing the infiltration of mononucleus in hepatic parenchyma and uh, during the life stages the uh, especially the l4 stage is going to uh, migrate through the lung and causing uh, some histopathological alterations so the picture is uh, showing migrating larva causing pulmonary edema and consolidation and come to the histological sections they are revealing the infiltration of inflammatory cells in lung alveoli so generally we can term it as a voluminous pneumonia so the uh, this is the another picture stephanurus dentatus which is uh, uh, identified 9.76% in the samples and especially the larval stages which are migrating through the uh, lung uh, liver tissue uh, which is uh, showing uh, uh, very uh, fibrotic changes and uh, the next picture you are seeing here on the screen is especially the adults which is uh, forming a cyst on the perirenal fat usually paired organisms you, you presenting in the cyst and this is the histological section of the liver which is infected with this uh, stephanurus dentatus so it is going the severe uh, uh, fibrotic tissue proliferation in hepatic parenchyma and uh, the uh, and this is the picture is revealing that the adult parasite is coming out from the perirenal fat and uh, usually uh, so wherever the uh, adult parasite is residing in this cyst some abscess formation also we can observe and this is a yellowish tinge material which is oozing from this cyst and uh, histological uh, sections this is the histological section of the perirenal fat tissue so this is a cyst wall and this please, is please go to your conclusion slide please go to your last slide conclusion slide Uh, this is a cystis or cellulose, and this is a sarcocystis and uh, trichuris. Also, we had uh, identified, and uh, so some of the lung forms and uh, cystogens also we recorded. And finally, uh, these parasites is going to damaging the organs, and uh, so in such a way they uh, retarded the growth, and in very severe infestations, it leads to the death also. So in that, uh, I'm concluding that 
by considering this uh, ascaris zoon, which creating the so uh, visceral larva migrants and cysticercosis, uh, the teniosis uh, and sarcosis is all are having genotic importance. So that's why we have to be uh, take it into a, a seri um, seriously. We have to make uh, some uh, uh, locate the clusters of endemic regions so uh, we can uh, implement the control measures uh, against these parasitic diseases. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Please continue. Please close your presentation. Chairperson, maybe you can request OP presenter eight. Anybody are there? OP presenter eight. Eight, nine, ten. Nine is available, I think. So. Nine is ready to present. Yes, ma'am. I'm ready. Yeah, please. <coughs> Omar, please host her. Finish within three, four eight. minutes. Ma'am, already I made co-host, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Please go to your results uh, discussion. Morning, and uh, I'm here to present a topic on pathological and molecular investigation of phylogenic neurotropic Newcastle disease outbreak in a private emu farm. So this Newcastle disease, it's caused by a virulent Newcastle disease virus. Please, which please is go to your title slide. We are not seeing your slides moving. Sir? You are not sir. using your title slide. Yeah, sir. I have shared it. But your slides are not moving. Put it in view. Yeah. No, no introduction, background, title slide, results, conclusion, discussion. Title slide first. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, put your title slide. So this is the title slide, sir. Can you hear me? No, 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 no. no. We are seeing only background slide. Are, hmm. You go previous one. Good. Try manually clicking your title slide. Yes, uh, okay. Sir. Yeah. So this is the title, title slide. Sir. Go to results, discussion, and conclusion. So uh, we have uh, encountered a disease uh, outbreak in an emu farm where we have say, uh, where we have seen severe mortality, uh, which includes uh, severe nervous signs just before death, and we have uh, collected samples from both the ailing birds and also from the uh, post-mortem. So from the live birds, we have collected cloacal swabs and during post-mortem, we have collected brain for virus isolation. And for histopathology, we have collected samples like brain, spleen, cecal tonsils, etc. And all these and samples and were... Your moving. slides are not moving. And yeah, you just show your slide where you are speaking. Yes, ma'am. So all these samples were screened for avian influenza and they were found to be <laughs> negative. Hence, uh, we are... Uh, these samples were processed and inoculated into nine day old embryonated chicken eggs and uh, the vi isolated virus was confirmed by serological tests like hemagglutination and hemagglutination inhibition test and further confirmation was carried out by reverse transcription PCR using uh, universal primers targeting partial fusion gene and these are the... Can you uh, hear me? Yes, me? Can you hear me? Yeah, why don't you move your slides first? You click on the results slide, then we'll see at least what you are so showing pictures. Can you hear? Can you see yeah, the slide? You logged, up, you logged up in first slide, that is title slide. You just move. Yeah, where you are speaking, you show those slides. Put it in yeah. view. Uh, in view mode, that is, yeah, PowerPoint view. Gone. Okay, go on. No, ma'am. Just now I started yeah. sharing yeah. again. Can you see now, ma'am? Yeah, now it is, uh, we are seeing, but what happened? No, you put it in Madam, a... Madam, yeah. please go to your uh, results. Yeah, sir, I have uh, entered the result show. slide. So we have done post-mortem and the lesions observed were complete congestion in all the visceral organs, including congestion in the brain. And the uh, intestines are filled with cataral contents, filled with mucosal congestion. And congestion also is observed in the trachea. And there is complete consolidation of the lung. So when the virus is inoculated, when the samples are inoculated into the chicken embryos, the virus was isolated and the virus present in the samples could cause death of the embryos and cause cherry red discoloration of the inoculated embryos along with occipital hemorrhages. And the amnioallantoic fluid collected from the dead embryos caused hemagglutination with 10% RBC. This shows that the virus, uh, some hemagglutinating agent is present in the sample. And to, con to confirm that the, it is ND virus, we should uh, do hemagglutination inhib inhibition test using hyperimmune serum raised against Lasota vaccine. And that is used for hemagglutination inhibition. And when this process was done, the hemagglutination of the uh, 
agent was inhibited hence we can confirm that the virus is newcastle disease virus and further confirmation was carried out by reverse transcription pcr where the partial fusion gene of 356 base pairs was amplified and the virus was characterized for its virulence by different methods like mean death time intracerebral pathogenicity index and fpcs motif so this mean death time was carried out in nine old nine day old chicken embryos where the uh, result the time taken for the a particular dilution of the virus to kill all uh, embryos is 42 hours and for a virus to be velogenic or highly virulent the value should be less than 60 hours so it matches here and the virus can be considered as velogenic in the same way the intracerebral pathogen city index is stand out in day old chicks and the value is 2 and the fpcs motif that is fusion protein cleavage site we should have more than 3 or more basic amino acids within the amino acid residues of 112 to 117 and that again matched so the virus which was isolated from it, it the feed stock please conclude please conclude and in the same way the histopathology was also identified and the main lesions observed in the brain were predominant and that shows that that is the imu has encephalitis which includes hemorrhage in the meninges chromatolysis perivascular cuffing and neuronal phagia and other lesions are also found in the lung like severe edema and congestion emphysema and thickening in the same way proventriculus and intestines also please conclude the... please conclude please stop your presentation so the finally we can uh, conclude that the disease uh, the outbreak in the emu farm was due to a neurotropic velogenic newcastle disease virus and the virus was confirmed by serology by hemagglutination inhibition test and reverse transcription pcr and the uh, velogenic or the virulence of the virus was confirmed by mean death time please continue please please stop your presentation please stop your presentation please conclude so this Madam. confirms that the virus is very much predominant in all the areas and the, uh, even though the flock is properly vaccinated still uh, the vaccine strain should be revamped and the existing vaccine should be changed with genotype matching vaccine so that the, we can protect the vaccines we can protect the okay thank you thank you please stop your presentation you are not concluding at all please stop please log out Next presenter, presenter, uh, OP presenter, ten is ready. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, you have only two, two minutes, three minutes. Salient features you present. Good morning to one and all. Two minutes. Uh, I... Ovarian cyst adenoma has been found in a slaughtered. Donkey. Uh, donkey was necropsied and polycystic ovaries have been identified. Left ovary was slightly enlarged, and and it was about round to firm transluc translucent cysts were identified. On cut section, clear watery fluid was oozing from the cyst. Coming to left ovary, it is also having translucent cysts. Upon cut section, revealed mucus viscous fluid oozing from the cyst. And upon histopathology, the left ovary revealed papillary cyst adenoma structures, whereas right ovary revealed multiple follicular cysts. On histology, the left ovary has finger-like papillary projections into the lumen of the cyst, which are lined by multi layer cuboidal to columnar epithelial cells which are having eosinophilic cytoplasm and distinct cell margins uh, based on histopathology it had been confirmed as serous papillary cyst adenoma here uh, photomicrograph showing finger like papillary projections extending into the lumen of the lumen of the ovary uh, which are lined by ciliated columnar epithelial cells in right ovary thin wall cyst uh, lined with multiple layer of granular cells containing pink fluid in the antrum was found based on histopathology it was confirmed as follicular cyst here uh, in this case the, uh, in the left ovary based upon the gross and microscopic finding papillary cyst adenoma has been found and in the right ovary granular follicular cyst was found based upon the gross and histopathological findings 
thank you thank you sir good 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 morning thank you presenter number 10 anybody are having question one or two no 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 questions please okay. no no question thank you op presenter 2 is ready op presenter 6 is ready op presenter 8 is ready please meet me my sit me op presenter 2 6 and 8 are you there no one is okay, responding not, uh, this session is over last opportunity op presenter 2 6 and 8 are you there online okay over to you chairperson and reporter you can conclude the session all together one two shall i first shall read out for you op presenter 1 presented first op presenter 4 presented next op presenter 7 was the third person op presenter 5 was the fourth person op presenter 3 was the fifth person op presenter 9 was the sixth person op presenter 10 was the seventh person only these have presented the judges also kindly note out uh, you can send me as early as possible the uh, score card the three persons missed are op presenter 2 op presenter 6 and op presenter 8 okay due okay, to sir. lot okay. of network issues from the presenter side we have lost lot of time and we have to hasten up the thing so that uh, within 1 minute we have to start the next session so i thank the chairperson and the reporter i thank the judges who have taken their pains to judge online and i hope everything is clear so thank you all for uh, conducting this session well thank you thank you all Thank okay, you, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. We'll send the scorecards. Thank you. Please send the scorecards. Ah, immediately. Okay. Thank you. Now I welcome uh, you all to the last session. That is the session six. This is the lead paper session. I request the chairperson and reporter, chairperson Dr. C H Venkata Seshaya. the professor and head of uh, livestock farm complex of the college and dr e nagamalika associate professor department of lpt of this college to please uh, take over the session as you can see from this we have uh, six presenters and uh, every one of them has asked that they are uh, busy with uh, other uh, issues and they wanted to stick to the time frame i hope the first lead paper presenter dr p selvaraj is online sir uh, good morning good morning to all uh, good morning uh, i request dr p selvaraj please share your screen we will start the session we have to complete by 2 pm total six papers are there i request dr p selvaraj selvaraj you have to unmute yourself you are speaking but you have not uh, unmuted yeah i able to hear me sir yeah yeah, yeah. now please please proceed yes. okay sir P please please share your uh, presentation yeah, sir yeah i able to visualize now sir yeah yes yeah okay sir okay thank you all right uh, good morning all of you uh, first of all i should thank the team at ganavaram you have done a wonderful job in many of the colleges and universities anatomy is almost like Uh, neglected uh, areas now by periodically organizing these conferences you are making inroads into some of the frontier areas for example the chennai experience i can share with you the anatomy has grown into we have lost your screen and voice Sorry, your voice is not audible. Sir, I think he lost connectivity, sir. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. We lost the screen as well as the voice. Oh, for the information of all, uh, each of the lead presenters uh, asked for shuffling of the order, then shuffled, reshuffled, uh, wanted to stick to their half an hour time and wanted to leave. Uh, some uh, uh, after the reshuffle said, no, no, we'll come as per the original order. Okay. And we have adjusted everything till this moment also. And I don't know, this lead paper presenter also specifically wanted the first slot and wanted to leave by 11.30. So we put him at 11 to 11.30. Unfortunately, he got locked out. The second speaker specifically asked, I want to go by 12 o'clock. So we put him between 11.30 and 12. The third speaker, uh, number of times, uh, shuffle, reshuffle, and finally said, I'll stick yes, to the sir. order. Uh, OK, sir. Yeah, OK. okay. 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 Right, sir. All right, uh, adjust the share screen. All right, sir. So this uh, picture in the title slide is the University of Padua, Italy. This is the anatomy department. It's a medical university started somewhere in the 12th century. This is where Galen and Vesalius has done wonderful things. Now, if you look at the Vesalius Center in the US and UK, this has totally become a clinical skill development center. So this is what I always urge our anatomists to do. Coming to my presentation, why I am uh, going with the regenerative medicine is the cell biology. We have a lot of cells within our own body. We have not used the potential to therapeutic purposes. So that is the uh, talk of today's presentation. So basically, as of now, what we are going in Tanu was, we have a, we have a center for... Good morning. Yeah, we, we have a center for stem cell research and regenerative medicine. We started way back in 2009-10 onwards, and it came now into full-fledged center. Now, what are the two things very commonly you can use is the plasma itself as well as stem cells. So what they call pla platelet-rich plasma, the other one is the stem cells. PRP, I think many of the veterinary colleges started using it seems. Uh, as far as Chennai is concerned, long, for long, almost like more than five, six years, they have been using it. Now, the purpose of plasma is they've got a rich growth factors. Stem cells too have growth factors. So either stem cell or a pla platelet uh, rich plasma, this can be used. Now, what are the growth factors? Some, something called transforming growth factors or platelet growth factors or insulin-like growth factors or vascular growth factors. So many factors, the fibroblast, all of them are essential for the rejuvenation of the cell. Even if the cell has some damages, these growth, growth factors will totally repair the cell and bring back into the normal. Not only that, they will aid in the vessel development. So they de de develop a new vessel and repair the damaged ones and brought in cells to that. And then they will start growing into the newer ones. For example, this is a schematic one where you can derive your platelets from any animal, as a dog or whichever species. So you can use it for many, many purposes. Uh, for example, skin, tendon, bone fractures, all these things. These are the common ones. Now we move into some of the systemic applications in different systems. For example, PRP, many of the things, they use it in the musculoskeletal injury part. For example, tendonitis, when there is a ligament injury or tear, bursitis osteoarthritis. So these are routinely being used almost throughout the world. And in India too, people started using this. Now, the next part is stem cell. This is where little tricky works and laborious works involved. Basically, we've got two cells like embryonic and adult. Embryonic, we don't work anymore because of the ethical regulations. Adult cells, these are the ones currently we do. Now, what are the sources? Almost all tissue cells can be used, but the commonly used are like bone marrow, adipose tissue, and that of the skin and liver. But the most commonest one is like bone marrow, but mesenchymal from the adipose is the very commonest used among all the stem cells. You have it. So the potency of them to differentiate into any type, it is there. So you know pretty well that there are uh, uh, any cell lines can be derived from any of the things. Okay. Now, when you are thinking of the 
uh, bone marrow aspirate uh, it's basically hematopoietic stem cells but they do have adipose also i mean some mesenchymal also so easiest way to get it is bone marrow aspirate and culture them and use them or uh, take a piece of adipose tissue in some of the body parts and use them now where these bone marrow aspirate things are being used for example uh, all the musculoskeletal injuries like open wounds when you require a bone graft or spinal, spinal injuries okay the burns all these things they have been using for example our medical counterparts in chennai you are selvaraj yeah yeah selvaraj yeah. ee yeah. 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 ultrasound both come process again injuries now which are the sources for the mesenchymal i think anywhere you can get it done in your surgery theater or if you are doing some sort of a if, if the animal died immediately cadaver is there you can collect them and preserve even umbilical cord you can get it so if we started doing some of the preservations even with the umbilical cord cells but you need to have a good facility to have that so with it we can manipulate the cells into different kinds like neural progenitors or mesenchymal and later currently they call what they call the ipc induced pluripotent stem cells all these are possible and i worked for example when i was in the us we work with all the species including dog cat and horse and pigs and the cells are coming up wonderfully the only thing you need to harvest in adequate quantity and put them into the safety parameters and then you go for the uh, translation purposes okay now what are the commonest musculoskeletal equine industry is the major common one worldwide people are using in india prp being used for in the equine industry but stem cell i don't think people have come into uh, direct uh, applications as of now so what you can get is you can get from the blood and uh, adipose tissue or bone marrow whichever uh, you want to get you can get them isolate the cells culture them expand them in the laboratory uh, prove their clinical efficacy and prove that there is no toxicity like teratoma or other thing then transfer them for clinical grade applications like a bone marrow fracture or tendinopathy laminitis many of the equine industry are now advancing towards uh, uh, replacing the conventional methods or adding stem cells to the conventional methods to treat the uh, injuries and they have got great successful results now the next one i move into is the cardiovascular it's a highly potential area where veterinarians can contribute really in a high uh, uh, volume of work the reason is can i we get lot of uh, cardiovascular disorders example dilated cardiomyopathy but one of the differences we don't get ischemic cardiomyopathy in the uh, animals especially in the dogs we don't get so which are be once your cardiac cell can repair it possibly we can translate to the human medicine but uh, the, so far the one area where we are not gaining success in the is, is the cardiac stem cells or therapy for the cardiovascular disorders reason is uh, uh, it's it's a dynamic organ right for example if you are uh, delivering the cells intralesionally into the myocardium or into the sinus area somewhere the cells will not stay there the next day so that is a major challenge what they call homing of the cells the cells has to be present in the the site to get a cure for example ischemia is there in the left inferior wall it has to stay there but unfortunately cells are not staying there so now people are thinking about using a cuff hold patch patch approach so many things to make the things work on the heart so uh, in veterinary for example in florida people have direct i mean tried for direct intralesional delivery of cardiac stem cells into the injured site using cath lab and the image guided system but unfortunately within a week they can't able to find out the cells now the tracking of the cells this is another important area of research for veterinarians both anatomy or cell biologists over we need to tag specific compounds something like radio labeling so you need to do and you need to track these are the common protocols we need we need to establish now where these stem cells are successful is some of the easiest diseases uh, in, in case of digestive tract for example dental or oral diseases in feline they have got a feline is one species they have got lot of clinical grade translation of the stem cell therapy for example gingivostomatitis uh, there are lot of uh, 
chronic uh, it's a chronic nature of disease which never gets heals even with the osteoarthritis and other thing so what they did was they collected the stem cells and started using chimera or adipose derived uh, whatever it be they started using now this uh, first picture on the left is the pre treatment now an improvement on the right you got a substantial improvement with the two case studies so these are all in the public domain anybody can do that but the thing is we need to try we need to harvest cells and try and attempt uh, naturally every college people will can you can do it easily it's only a cell culture work don't get alarmed that it is something like a high high yield for example some of the areas like heart you need to have a good facility for the basic thing if you have a stem stem cell i mean cell culture lab but at least please try to have a dedicated cell culture lab don't culture the viral viral work in the same uh, cubicles so that is the fundamental thing i want to say now the other area where adipose derived mesen chimeras have been successfully used and almost like got into the human translation is ibd right inflammatory bowel disease irritable bowel these are the one it, it it's a very huge challenge for human beings as well as uh, dogs now the picture on the left you see almost like a bleeding mucosal surfaces now after stem cell therapy you can see uh, something like a pale pink mucosa with minimal i mean a very minimal vascularization but on the right you see everything is vascular the lumen is not visible such an inflammatory changes are present now the other promising area is the renal this is where veterinarians can really transform because renal disease is the next it to heart renal disease is the major killer for human being as well as the animals now many of the trials have already started but cat trials have been very successful with stem cell th uh, therapy so the, those diagnosed with chronic kidney disease ckd so in these cases they tried for repeated injection through intravascular route the allogenic mesenchymal stem cells and fortunately they have got a, i mean these all derived from the amniotic membranes but even i mean one of the advantages fortunately just after the second administration they were able to see a very significant improvement now if you look at the chennai picture almost the more than 50 to 60 cats we see in the medicine ward alone and nearly 10 to 15 of them are ckd cases we have got a potential translational animal public spontaneous disease population only thing we need to apply these models and then i mean cells and use these as a spontaneous models if we got it successful translate that to our human beings so that many of the aged people in india will benefit uh, please be aware in india ckd is emerging as one of the worst worst disease that's why a human nephrologist we know here a top in pediatric nephrologist he put the nsaid like whatever when when there is a headache people used to take paracetamol or whichever thing all the nsaids are the painkillers are kidney killers he has presented documented uh, successfully even with single dose how people get what deteriorated their kidney now we move on to the next one respiratory this is another area but unfortunately not much uh, emerging therapies are coming up only very few limited but again a very potential area for example are uh, chronic inflammatory diseases sometimes they cause uh, recurrent airway obstructions now these are the ones for example just image a racing industry equine racing industry uh, respiratory tract is the most important thing for them now if the tract gets frequently occluded with secretions or the lumen is getting smaller imagine how much volume of air that gets the thing is uh, when the horses are running in the high speed they will be galloping 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 and they require very many hundreds of gallons of air into their respiratory tract to support them if the air is not going inside then imagine the, the horse cannot able to do that once the oxygen delivery is reduced naturally the myocardial oxygen i mean while running the horse will have a highest myocardial oxygen demand now if the oxygen demand is uh, not met automatically cardiac a catastrophe starts in they will lose valuable race horses on the track momentarily they die if you look at the uh, very advanced racing countries or race tracks always there will be ambulance running simultaneously with the horses nowadays the technology has advanced uh, using the wireless they will be tracking the heart rate with the ambulance so on live they will be tracking the heart rate for example there is some catastrophic thing probably they will put a word to the people and concern people they will take a call whether to run the race or to abandon the race so that's why equine industry they invest a huge amount for stem cell therapy the next one is neuromuscular this is where human medicine needs 
a lot of efforts from any science, either veterinary science, cell biology, molecular biology, bioengineering, biomaterial sciences, because you, we can't expect neuron or tissue to grow rapidly. Or I think you know pretty well that it's, it's a very difficult task. Okay. So what the people uh, currently, recently, people are using the mesenchymal stem cells of bone marrow derived origin. So they've tried, for example, a few years back, even in our veterinary campus here, we did for a spinal cord and it, it, it improved. I think to my knowledge, that was the first spinal cord injury in animals in India getting treated and recovering. So they collect these stem cells and they use it with a conventional surgical approach like they will do with the hemilaminectomy and apply uh, these stem cells and then follow it for a particular period and how the gait improves and other things. The other one is uh, now the technology has advanced even to try the use of epidural uh, adipose derived mesenchymal stem cells. So it also produced a very good faster locomotor recovery where even the dogs was able to uh, run through the treadmills. So this is where because many of the dogs with injuries, we find it extremely difficult to get back their rehabilitation or mobility. So stem cells, biomaterials, uh, what they call uh, tissue engineering, that is another facet of the stem cell biology or regenerative medicine. So that will be also be uh, useful. Now we move into the skin. This is the wonderful area where the dermatologist now concentrating both for skin and hair. Hair stem cell transplant has already started in Japan. Japan is the pioneering in many of the stem cell biology as well as clinical translation. Now the Japan has come with stem cell as a transplant. So these people with bald, they can get it totally uh, regrown with the stem cell therapy. Now the next area is burns or any of the chronic skin wounds or ulcerative wounds. Now, these are the uh, large extensive wounds. They are unable to get healing rapidly. Sometimes the rapid, I mean, massive amount of burns. So this is where the current research is going on. People have started using the stem cells uh, to get it a rapid recovery. For example, they try, did a trial in goat, sheep and horses and dogs also. Uh, for example, in, in some of the chronic diseases, uh, I think in the picture, if you can see in the left, how the, there is a erythematous patches in the skin and after the stem cell therapy, how it got completely improved. So even the exosome vesicles, nowadays people, uh, rather than cell, the cell secretomes are cell secretory substances or factors they started using. So mesenchymal derived exosomal vehicles, people have started using. The another area currently, even in Chennai, Tamil Nadu and other countries, people are using is ophthalmic, ophthalmology, ophthalmic surgery and other places. Like chronic uh, corneal ulcers, caseous, cartocatoidist, Sika, all these things, what happens? The wound does not get healing uh, healed at all. Whatever steroid you use or whatever uh, injections or treatment you keep on doing, they are not improving. But but after the advent of these uh, stem cells, people started applying this cell therapy and they saw that there is a complete recovery and a very good vision within about three to four weeks. So regaining a vision using our stem cell therapy, that's what's happening in the uh, IA institutes, both in the human medicine and the uh, veterinary thing. So now what are we are doing in the uh, Tanwa setup? We have these stems, I think many of you know that we have a facility of a, a center called stem, Center for Stem Cell Research and Regenerative Medicine. Somewhere a group started the work in 2009 and it got materialized by around 12 and the building other thing got set up by around 14 and people are doing a lot of work. Now this is basically a stem cell biology work. Uh, they are doing it in the stem cell center. Now there is another component called regenerative medicine. So what is regenerative medicine? You need to translate things into the clinical application. This is where the challenge, because whatever cells you give from the lab, I can't directly apply. Even now, we are not transitioned into clinical phase with the laboratory expanded cells. Instead, we are trying to get cells from the body, what we call endogenous regenerative medicine. There is a thing called uh, in vitro and in vivo like the laboratory generated cells may not have clinical grade quality. So now we moved into clinical grade stem cell therapy or regenerative medicine using the body's own cells without taking them out. Uh, that, that's what the practice is called endogenous. So we use some of the technologies called apheresis. Apheresis is nothing but, I think there are pictures I'll show you. That uh, it's something like a blood donation. The animal will come and donate the blood, but the, here, it goes into a machine called apheresis system, something like a dialyzer. It takes only stem cell and sends back all the materials again, back to the donor. 
it, it, it will not remove anything out. So that what we call uh, stem cell cell harvesting. Okay. So this is the machine. What you see in the case screen. This is the machine. Now there are advanced machines that come up. Here the dog is there. You put a jugular vein and take out the catheter. Put it into the circuit here. What they call extracorporeal circuits. And uh, here you in the top you see the bags okay the collection bags four or five bags will be there different products will be collected there will be another line returning from the machine that goes into the patient and this will return the remaining cells like wbcs or, or rbcs whatever the plasma whatever content we will be collecting only the required amount of cells and for that we use, we use some of the treatment protocols what we call CGS of protocols, colony stimulating growth factor therapy. We use some of the injections uh, prior, prior to the collections that will induce the bone marrow in, in the bone marrow proliferation of the progenitor cells. Now, this progenitor cells will be available in the peripheral blood, and through this machine setup, using a special kit, we'll be collecting them all. So, this is another dog that is going on. Now, simultaneously, because the entire blood volume will be coming out here, we have to manage with a lot of fluid balance. It's something like a cardiac bypass surgery, but we don't do any surgery here. We just manage with extracorporeal circuits and start collecting the uh, therapeutic products. For example, here you see the RBC packs, then stem cell packs will also look like this, then the plasma, whatever fluid you want to collect, this can be possible. And uh, the cell therapy experience, I think you know, you know that Dr. Sabiha was the one who was working with the hemopoietic stem cells in the uh, laboratory grade with our stem cell center. She was heading the department for almost like many years. We started from 2014. Now we moved into the clinical grade cell therapy. How without going into the laboratory, using the bone marrow itself to augment its progenitor cell population using the colony stimulating growth factor uh, therapy. For example, we have an injection called the pegfilgrastin. Okay. These are all recombinant uh, granulocyte colony stimulating factors. We have a protocol with which we administer and after a few days, like two days or three days, depending upon the requirement of the cell therapy, we will be administering these things. Now, we have taken them into the direct clinic for some other diseases also. This filgrastim, it's a peg filgrastim, is a little bit costly. There is a plain filgrastim. Now, this filgrastim we started using for uh, the diseases where there is uh, what we can say, not a rapid recoupment of cells from the bone marrow. For example, E. canis, similarly in the dengue fever, there is a pancytopenic crisis. Bone marrow is unable to immediately support. Uh, probably even the whatever it produces, the uh, uh, infection kills also. So simultaneously along with your triple th therapy like doxas, like not, or whatever treatment you are giving Bernil, we always you use the, I mean, not always, depending on the case, we'll be using the filgrastim protocol. So once with the conventional therapy, if you add filgrastim, the thrombocyte count, the white blood cell count, then the, for example, WBC means we got a separate, separate factor called darbipoietin. If it is a WBC or stem cells, we will be using the filgrastim. For example, platelet, we'll be using a factor called romiplastin. So these are the things nowadays we have been totally moved into the clinical setup. The human products, you can get it and start using them. So these are the advantages are in nutshell about the uh, cell therapy, uh, what we have achieved with the clinical practice. Now, at this moment, I want to thank the people who have made it possible for Canvas to achieve. Some amount of clinical translation is the guy called Dr. Eyestone. Uh, he was a faculty at Virginia Tech where we got the opportunity to get trained. But one of the things, uh, this fellow was uh, almost like a forefather to Jan Wilmot. He developed the entire cloning technology, then left UK and came to US. But within a few years, Wilmot took over to the charges and uh, brought in the Dali works. So such a brilliant fellow. And he was the one who was working on many, many cell cultures. Uh, like he can convert the fibroblast into cardiomyocytes, so many things. And another cardiologist, he helped us to develop many of the uh, therapy protocols into the clinical re regime is Dr. Abbott. All of them with the Virginia at that point of time. Now they are in the different phases. And uh, for example, in my training that time, they just put me within the first week to do it in a day old mice cardiovascular procedure. As a veterinarian, I never got trained in mice uh, in, in such a thing. 
the two with the clinical medicine i don't have an opportunity now my purpose is to deliver they will be delivering the cells i need to see whether the cells are present here so uh, some some sort of a, a terrifying experience in the first that somehow a visit to the wake forest this is the pioneering center i think if students are listening uh, this center is the one it's al almost what we can call a mecca of regenerative medicine and a clinical grade this wake forest as a, a state of the art regenerative medicine center i think our some of our students are already working if people want to go there like post graduation phd post doc we can definitely helpful and this is another faculty dr jackson they developed aphrasis for animal protocols and from them we got uh, many of the advantages with them now this is the wake forest product what they have it in the hand is the artificial kidney it's a cell engineered what our organ engineering or tissue engineering now already they have gone back into human clinical trials for congenital kidney diseases they transplanted uh, artificial kidney if you go to youtube and put dr antony atla he is the uh, he is a mind boggling physician urologist totally transplanting every organ so that is the artificial kidney they are doing it and one of the indian who is part of this artificial kidney is dr sunil we have a long association with dr sunil if any of your graduates are wanted to go there definitely we can help you and then all all this become a possibility because the virginia tech veterinary college they helped us to develop this specialty so with this i conclude thank you all if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer that thank you sir uh, uh, thank you uh, for valuable information you have given thank you sir this regenerative medicine sir yes, now the session is open for discussion is there any questions uh, sir i want to ask something sir yeah please uh, sir like stem cells are being used for many of the diseases sir yes sir uh, i have seen some cases of the retinitis pigmentosa in uh, my knowing people sir okay Can we treat that disease with the stem cell therapy sir yeah the here is pigmentosa may not be always amenable because the melanin cells whatever the pigment cells eh, those stem cells they have not done much work okay sir probably some work might be there but as far as as a clinician i i know the clinical grade part only i'll be knowing okay uh, okay sir the, the major part will be doing uh, on these areas like musculoskeletal uh, the digestive and this the ocular the wound healing part they will be doing but wherever the pigments are involved i think we are unable i mean still we don't get a much a good quality paper that supports a pigment based cells okay sir okay sir yeah thank you thank you sir sir one more question sir there. yeah please hello yes yeah, sir please go ahead sir one more question yeah ah, please. please 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 you are audible please go ahead please ask the question Or else you can uh, type in chat box. I think he got disconnected, sir. Okay. Okay, leave it. No problem. Okay. Participants, if you want to ask a question, you can ask directly, or you can put in chat box. There is. Uh... Okay. Okay. Thank. Thank you, sir. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, team Ganavaram. It's a wonderful thing you all doing. Keep doing it, sir. I should see a big clinical skill development center in the anatomy departments at uh, IAP or other Telangana colleges. Please yeah. do it. It's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I thank you, you very can, much. If you have time permits, you just visit the website of the Vasalius. clinical skill development center that is manned totally by anatomy people but they have been doing wonderfully we can have one center at least in india yeah all the best sir. Right. thank you thank you sir thank you thank you for the yeah. thank you thank you thank you sir sir now i request uh, dr uk mishra now i request dr uk mishra please start your uh, start your presentation sir dr uk mishra 
I think he is not online. He is not seen in the participants list. Yeah, please be interacting. I'll just uh, call him. You can casually interact. I'll I'll let you know within a minute. I'll call him. Okay, sir. Sir, I have confirmed with him. Sir, he is about to get online. Sir. Ah, okay. So, ma'am. <clears throat> Mishra was also particular that he wants to leave by twelve o'clock. Sir, I have so, contacted. Wait. Sir, he is getting online. Sir. Okay. Okay. We will wait. Mm, sir. Uh, Tomar, uh, kindly put the feedback link. Ah, uh, yes, sir. I will put, sir. Yeah, so that the people will take their own time when they are logged in uh, to send the feedback. And yes, for sir. the benefit of the listeners uh, in Zoom as well as YouTube, you have sir. to submit at least five out of the six uh, feedback links. Feedback forms are given in the feedback links in every session to get a e-participation certificate. the presenters have to submit at least five feedback forms so be vigilant and uh, kindly submit the feedback forms dr lakshman is there kindly inform dr moon moon sharma dr devendra patak yes sir i am there good morning sir yeah, yeah thank you madam welcome please stay online yes sir thank you yeah dr ragunath i think he is not there sir yeah we will wait maybe they are waiting for their uh, time yes. in sequence we'll wait madam is already there good dr lakshman also said that uh, he would join by that time and wanted to finish we'll wait for dr mishra we had a little uh, problem with the mvsc phd and the multidisciplinary presenters uh, because most of them did not have good uh, net connectivity and yes sir uh, Uh, they could not uh, upload their uh, presentation we lost time so in the multidisciplinary session we had to hurry up and uh, cut short the time so the general uh, information to all is uh, kindly see that uh, you have good connectivity from your side otherwise you are causing trouble to the organizers you should ensure that and you are causing trouble to your uh, fellow participants also because we are constrained to डायरेक्टली Your screen is visible, sir. You okay, can start okay, your presentation. Sir. Sir. So I thank uh, Dr. Kishore and the organizing for giving me a chance to talk, and uh, I also 
thank uh, the chairman of the session for bearing a little uh, delay in time because of some network issues. I welcome to all the anatomists and the scientists in allied field. Uh, I have chosen the topic to, as you know, it is appearing before your screen, the prospect of natural alternatives in histopathology lab. In relation to particularly the staining techniques that we are using in, in our histology lab, particularly in anatomical labs, because we are frequently using not only hematoxin using, we also many other stains we are frequently using. Versus in pathology, actually we are primarily using hematoxin hematoxin and using as the routine stain to for diagnostic purpose. Rarely in pathology we go for uh, the special stains, but mostly we depend on histologen hematoxin used in for the diagnostic uh, purpose. Now the current concern in this field is our as you, as you know use of animal alternatives in life science. We should try to become uh, to go green and grow or, or go organic. Body donation program, as you know, Dr. Kisar has given the theme. Thus, the need of the hour is to use uh, of suitable alternatives in our field. Now, alternatives in histoprocessing, particularly with uh, particularly in reference to the staining techniques, means alternative to the staining techniques. Now, in histoprocessing lab, it may be histology lab and histopathology lab. In the world, we are producing about 2.5 million of hematoxylin and eosin stain slide each day. Please see the turnover of the hematoxylin and eosin stain slides in a day worldwide. Thus, hematoxylin and eosin is very much inevitable in diagnostic histopathology. And as you know, histoprocessing labs keeps much meaning in our medicine. Now, the chief activities that we go for in our histoprocessing lab, as you know, is a fixing, dehydration, cleaning, infiltration, and embedding, then sectioning, and finally, staining. Now, several chemicals are used nowadays for these processing steps. Now, finally, without going for this, uh, your preservation means fixation, then clearing, then staining, then the dehydration, embedding. My topic is directly on the staining. Thus, some of the dyes are carcinogenic and genotoxic. For example, aramino, basic fusin, crystal violet, aniline, constituva, benzene derived dyes such as congorate, and etc. Now, the limitations with the conventional chemicals that we are using currently in our laboratory is that exposed to such chemicals or dyes. Is, dyes is hazardous to the health. They are not environment friendly, which is the biggest challenge of the current day. Second, the third point is the cost involvement. And the next, the concept of use of natural alternate in tissue processing. It's an age old practice. See, the, the concept has actually came from the Egyptian civilization, as you know, the mummies were preserved by the early Egyptian, by several salts like natrum or meat, beeswax, bitumen, cassia, onions, lichen, etc. Thus, preservation, the concept of preservation and using natural alternatives for preservation purpose is quite old. Thus, the present, now today what we'll discuss, now what has been done so far in in the field of a natural alternatives for staining purpose and what we have done and what remains to do. So what has been done so far in the literature? I'll just give a brief, as you know, hematoxylin, needless to say that hematoxylin campagenum is a herb or is a plant from which we are deriving this nuclear stain. Is every histologist and histopathologist, every veterinarian or medical student is conversant with the dye. Need not say. And the second one is a carmine. It's also a plant product. The third one is the carcad, means hibiscus sabdarifa. I am not going to take much time because this is only part of the review of literature. Now, this particular herb, carcade or hibiscus sabdarifa, is a very peculiar stain. It can be used as a cytoplasmic stain as well as in the nuclear stain. Beat I and second, beat one and beat two highlights 
how it can be used as a cytoplasmic cell as well as the same plant the extract or the dye extracted from the same plant can be used as a nuclear stain also these are all the protocols available in the literature so i need not go for it next hilar mehndi our anatomist and the lady pathologist and almost all the ladies are aware about the henna and mehndi it is carrying a dye component which can be extracted and can be used similarly another one is the wing fruit of the forest tree terocarpus ocean is one more the fruit is also seen shown on the right side from where we can extract the dye and can use in our histology lab these are the uh, works that have been already done by different authors with uh, say 70% extract extraction in 70% ethanol at 78 degree centigrade for 24 hours so there are several protocols how to use this particular wing fruit next china rose then sugar beet or red beet golden beet and red rose all these diagrams are given on the bottom of this slide this is china rose the first one then sugar beet the second one red beet is the third one fourth one is the golden beet and the last one is the rose as we are conversant and these are also commonly used as alternatives in staining techniques see the same plant for the staining of the parasit condition for example the first slide a to d shows on the left side shows the staining of the fasciola gigantica okay similarly this the third one the gastrophylax crumifer the same plant products are or the plant or extract derived dyes are used for this purpose the same thing exfoliate the same red beet extract how it is used for exfoliative cytology i will say please look at this one if it is visible to you, my cursor this is the cell and the black arrowhead is showing the nucleus similarly this is the cell of the oral cavity exfoliative cytology of the oral mucosa and this is the nucleus this is stained with red beet extract next one ginger or the scientific name, name ginger officially is also used as staining alternative in histological techniques see this use of the ginger this one the 95% ethanol extract of ginger staining the cardiac muscle fibers and these are the variants with the staining i am not going detail into that because this is all all collected from the literature then the red cas cabbage dye extract these are the literature then onion skin also used as a alternative these are the staining of the buccal epithelial cells with with the dye derived from the onion skin see this particular stain the dye used for this slide staining all these structures has been used from from onion skin extract at 37 degree centigrade the second one is the onion skin extract at 50 degree centigrade this is the same thing onion skin extract at 80 degree centigrade thus what i am trying to say see temperature also keeps a meaning during extraction of the dye and there are variants how to within using alum without using alum with a ferrous sulfate with a copper sulfate there are different mordants are also used then saffron crocus sativus is also used as a natural alternative in the staining techniques then sorghum bicolor is also used as a staining alternative this is the hematoxylin in eosin and with which saffron is used the grayish color what you see in this section of the skin is due to saffron the same thing then pomegranate flower is also the extract or the dye extracted from the pomegranate flower can also be used as a stain in histology lab you can see how the extraction is going on 100 degree centigrade for 60 minutes it extracts the dye color similarly black mulberry pomegranate seed then gal oak and these are the different diagrams you how the seed gal oak in chart the first one is see the staining of the blood cells with the pomegranate flower extract the second one is the gymsa you can see the comparative picture feature with the conventional gymsa and the herbal dye extract with the pomegranate flower extract how it is giving the picture almost comparable pictures and we can safely or we can certainly rely on the 
staining ability of the dyes that are derived from the natural alternative. That is what this slide gives the message. The same thing from the pomegranate flower. This is from the black mulberry, the first one. And these two diagonally placed pomegranate flower extract. And this one is from the gun oak. Next, the black plum. The dye derived from the black plum can also be used as natural alternatives. See, dragon fruit or the red dragon is also color extracted from this fruit or can also be used as natural alternative. Then mother, rubia tinctorium is also used as natural alternative. These are the staining with the mother's mother. This is granular, granular layer of the interneurons stained with the the upper one is the acidic mother, and this is from the ordinary mother. It is not acidified. This is a direct extract, and this is after acidified. See how the color is changing from the same cerebellum, cerebrum. Now, this is the section of the cere cerebellum showing the granular inter neuron layers. This okay. is the acidic mother, A, and this is the mother with the crystal violet. The acidic mother is going, giving greenish appearance or the structures stained green are the acid mother. You can see the Purkinje cells, how they are taking the stain. And these are the granular cells and these are the Purkinje cells. Similarly, the curcuma longa or what we call the haldi, it's a conventional stain, uh, the herbal stain is used in histology and also in parasitology laboratories. These are the different histological stains for using the uh, healthy extract, the turmeric extract with the maceration, and the lower one is the turmeric extraction with, with the help of succulent apparatus. See, the mode of extraction of the dye from the plant product is also, play, is also playing a meaning. The upper one is by simply grinding the healthy and extracted either in aqueous base or in alcoholic base. Whether one is not by grinding and Extraction in water is by a succulent apparatus. Thus, the mode of extraction also plays a role with the mordant and without mordant. Hematoxin use in turmeric with mordant, and this is hematoxin hemat and turmeric with mordant. This is simply com to compare with hematoxin use in lower one is the conventional one, and the upper one is the challenged one or the experimental one. Now, things are what we have done. Friends, let me say one thing. See, this topic is not new to us. We have been working since last three, four years on this topic. And also I have presented a part of it during the ISIL Convention of, Anat of the Anatomy National Symposium. There we have covered certain dyes and there from and where from we have covered many more agents in our laboratory. And I'm just going to brief these dyes that we have studied later on. But for the freshers of the for the persons who did not attend the ISL convention or the persons who have not exposed for these alternatives, in a brief I want to I want to show some of give some of the easy tips for your laboratory. Friends, as you know, we are using for a clearing agent, we are using several chemicals as you know, xylene, toluene, benzene. Suppose you do not have a xylene, benzene, toluene, what you can do? Please see all these four slides. The last one is the conventional one, means traditional one, we are using the xylene. Look at the rest three. The first one, we have used turpentine oil to clear the tissue instead of xylene. The second one, we have used, again, turpentine oil. The third one is also turpentine oil with three different tissues. So please appreciate the role of turpentine oil, which is available in any hardware store or in any store which is which are nowadays selling the different colors for your household work is available there, the turpentine oil. So we can safely use turpentine oil without using xylene. It is also cost effective and easily available in the local market. Next, kerosene. For deep before staining, we have to hydrate this section. And for that, we need to de-paraffinize the tissue section. 
Conventionally, we use xylene, but instead of xylene, we can safely use either kerosene or turpentine oil. The last one is the xylene control. Look at these two. They are no way less than the xylene one. Thus, for issue D for section D paraffinization, we can use safely kerosene oil as well as turpentine oil. Then coming to the staining proper, this part I have already explained our, our uh, ISIL convention. Look at this first slide. This is the conventional slide of a liver stained with hematoxin for 15 minutes. This second one, we have stained with the same hematoxin in all the three, but we use the extract of the banana tree or banana plant extract for different hours. See, in the first slide, we treated the following hematoxin stain, we treated with for two minutes. Look at the staining intensity of the nuclei, gradually how they are reducing. When we extracted the banana extract for eight minutes, the intensity of the nuclear stain further reduced. When we went for 12 minutes, keeping the hematoxin stain constant for all the four 15 minutes, we gradually increased the staining time with banana extract. And after 12 minutes, we saw the nuclear stain completely disappeared. This has forced us to conclude that probably the extract of the banana plant is acting as a, uh, is a clearing solution, means a differentiating solution, which are usually, we, usually, we use as a regressive method of hematoxin and eosin staining, 1% acid alcohol. We can safely replace the 1% acid alcohol with this banana extract this is the out this is the inference from this slide the next one is hematoxin with t extract the, the two we are taking in the aqueous phase this one with the hematoxin and t extract for three minutes look at this color what you see is because of the t extract same hematoxin five minutes t extract another five minutes that means we increase the time the intensity of the brown color is still increasing here, hematoxin we have reduced and we gave three minutes. The intensity is comparatively less. The standing intensity is comparatively poor. Next, we gave hematoxin five minutes, T extract three minutes, and 2% ferric chloride as more than five minutes. We got the deep brown color of the sarcoplasm of the skeletal muscles but the nuclear stain is completely abolished, maybe due to use of the ferric chloride. Thus, we see in this slide that hematoxin counter stain with it for five minutes, counter staining with a T extract, simply aqueous T extract for five minutes gives a good, good better result replacing eosin. We can replace eosin. Next, from here, this is from our current study. Up to this, our clearing agent, deferring agent, and the staining, what we've done, I presented up in the ISOL. And now, these are unique. We have, after ISOL, we have developed or worked these things. See, catechy, which is commonly used in our palm, beetle shop, to give a red color. We have used catechy aqueous extract and stain this slide for one hour. This is a slide of this come. Needless to say, friends, that you get the best jobs to see the contour of the tissue, the tissue reaction, the nuclear stain. Please appreciate by yourself. I need not say anything about this slide. The slide is completely before you. You are to judge whether you should depend on the catechu for nuclear stain or not. Then catechu with a lime for one hour. Now we have taken catechu and we have added lime to it and we have stained for one hour. Look at this color change, completely brownish. We get certain nuclear stains also here. Then catechu with lime, one hour staining in all the three. Simply, I want to say, look at the extent of the nuclear stain in these three slides. In all the three, we get nuclear stain. Now, if you look at the middle one, surprisingly, this is the section of the skin. In some of the scene sections, the cortex of the hair was stained, whereas in others, it remained unstained. This is nothing but the stratum corneum. And this is the dermis, where they, we get a lot of hair follicles. Some of the hairs, for example, this one, showing distinctly the inner 
follicular epithelium and the outer epithelium and including the hair where the cortex stands out, stands out very prominently. Now, how we have standardized? You see, we have used also cow dog extract. You see, in certain, in, uh, in the, uh, some past, I saw, I got a news from the national telecast that uh, Dr. Uh, our uh, uh, minister, Mr. Nitin, uh, Nitin Gadkari, he has claimed that they have developed a dye for painting the house. Uh, some of the IIT lab or some persons have developed it. So we thought, why not we try this cow dung extract for tissues? Thus, we try to standardize. This one is the raw cow dung extract whose pH is above, say, 8 to 9, completely alkaline, alkali one. Then we tried the second set after boiling. The pH changed from 2, 5 to 6. Raw extract, pH 8 to 9. If it is boiled, pH changes 5 to 9. Both the things we have used in our standing techniques. Look at this raw cow dung. This is the hylus uh, of a small intestine duodenum, staining the cow dung extract for 45 minutes. Now, the second one is the cow dung mixed with the tea extract, 30 minutes. The third one is cow dung, again mixed with the tea extract, duodenum, 30 minutes. You can appreciate the tips of Liverkun here. This is lamina propria, this is nothing but the mucosa. This is tunica muscularis, and this is tunica mucosa. This is the tip of Liverkun base part. And these are the villa, you can see the clear negative images. The results are not very much encouraging. Next, croton. This is a locally available plant, color leaves are deep brown in color. We have extracted, this is nothing but the duodenum. We can see the villi. This part we have enlarged. Please see this outline of the villi. This is the results are moderately appreciable in terms of giving a faint pinkish red color. You can see also the goblet cells, how they are staining. These are the goblet cells. These are the goblet cells. Similarly, cotton for 10 minutes staining. Then this is a plant available in our office premises. It is called as Mosenda philippica. Look at this plant available, may be available uh, all throughout the India. It's the flower. We have extracted one for aqueous extract and we stained this same duodenum for 30 minutes. And this is the picture we got. And however, the uh, results are not very much encouraging, though there is some extent of staining the, the dye extract has some ability to stain the tissue extract. See, the, this was an experiment with the peels of the orange, orange peels. This is the staining how we have covered this paste of the orange peel directly over this, our slides. And this is the pH where it is coming about to five to six. And this is the method of staining our, this is uh, the paraffin sections or the deparaffinized sections. And this is the result, how we got with the jejunum. Look at the borders of the villi. Look at the core of the villi. Look at this mucosa. And this is the tunica muscular. This is tunica serosa. These are the crypts. You are the best judge to appreciate the standing extent that is offered by the extracts from the orange peels. Hibiscus sabdirapha. Sabdarifa. That I have already, some other authors have worked it is claimed that it is a cytoplasmic stain as well as a nuclear stain. Please do appreciate the extent of cytoplasmic stain in the upper slide. In the lower side, both the cytoplasmic stain as well as the nuclear stain. Please appreciate the location of these nuclei in the stratified squamous epithelium and the nuclei of the wall of the hair follicle. In a magnified form, look at this hair, section of the hair and the follicle. Similarly, the, the stratified squamous epithelium and the wall of the hair follicle, both the nuclear stain as well as the cytoplasmic stain, of blue or dull blue. This is a flower. I mean, we have not identified. We, we, we are taking the help of our agriculture friend to identify this particular flower. Apparently, the flower is pink in color. So for your purpose, we have the pink, pink flower. We have taken the aqueous extract 
This is bright pink in color. pH comes about one. We have used to the skin sections. Please appreciate the extent of the cytoplasmic stain and the stain of different fibers in the dermis and the stratified squamous keratinized epithelium of the skin, including the hair follicle and the follicular one, and the dermis connective tissue. I think it is can 100% safely replace eosin, 100%, if you agree to me. Now, this is one more. This is not a this plant we have intentionally we have not shown in this particular picture because of certain IPR issues. Friends, so far we have discussed about the staining, histological staining. Surprisingly, in one of our trials with a particular horn, we found a differential stain. We found that in the GI tract, only some of the cells are staining with this extract, not all, in a peculiar way. Probably these are the cytoplasmic granules. Please look at this villi. These two locations, we are getting a villi at a low power, two cells. Now these two cells, we have just I have enlarged to see this cell. This is nothing but the surface epithelium. This is somehow the basal membrane. And this is the staining of this cell. That is this one. The second one, I have enlarged here. Look at the nucleus. And probably this is the cytoplasm. And this stain, what you see, is also standing here side by side. Now to, to show in a more accurate way, look at this special state. See, look at the background. Look at these two cells. Now look at this cell, this is the nucleus, and this is the small cone-shaped cytoplasmic cap over this cell. Here is one more cell. Here is one more cell. Friends, please appreciate this cell. I think you will be definitely convinced that this is a special stain. Look at the nucleus, not only the nucleus, look at the nu nucleolus, the euchromatic nucleus with the prominent nucleus and a cap of very wide, means very broad or distinctly visible large quantity of cytoplasm over this cell. So definitely you will agree that this is a cell and this particular herbal extract is not staining uniform all these cells, rather it is a selectively staining a particular cell category, giving an idea at least for the present that this can be surely used as a histochemical stain, not an ordinary histological stain, where all the cells react, react equally to a histological stain, but for histochemical stain, the particular cell component, depending on the chemical character, respond to a particular stain only. So we presume this particular herbal extract may be used as a histochemical stain. However, our studies are at very much grassroots level and preliminary level. We are still working on it. Friends, please look at this same villi. Here are the four cells, the same four cells. This is a herbal extract for IPR issue point of view, I have not purposefully exposed the plant name. Once we characterize the details about the plant, definitely if given a chance, I'll come up with this detail about the plant in your next presentation. I need not say, need not say that this is a cell where is the nucleus and where is the cytoplasm, you are the best job. Look at this cell, where is the nucleus and where is the cytoplasm, you are the best job. Of course, these two are having but compared to less clarity, but they are definitely cells. Now, how do we okay. infer? See, the role okay. of the temperature, extraction method, mordant, pH, and different solvents. While extracting the dye, definitely keeps much meaning. In our study, how, how we actually characterize our study? Our study revolves morely on the cell morphology, cell color, degree of reaction, and tissue dye binding. All these are in underway just to prepare a thesis. Then these are the references. This is all about the presentation. Thank you for your present hearing. If you want to discuss, you are welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mishra, sir, for the uh, valuable information you have given on herbal dye extracts. Uh, now the topic is open for discussion. Is there any queries? Or else you can type in the chat box. Sir, I have uh, one question in uh, YouTube chat box, sir. Yes. Sir, here uh, somebody asked from uh, that person is from Pakistan, sir, actually. 
Mm-hmm. YouTube is open for everyone. There is no restriction for the national uh, that uh, national people and all. Here the people are asking about that uh, when we are trying these type of extracts, what you are mm-hmm. saying, the the contrast is not that much, sir. We are losing the contrast. So what is the uh, significance of these type of staining techniques? No, uh, that is a limitation. That is what, uh, Dr. Sahib, I said that uh, when you are using the hematox, this uh, herbal extract, we have to think about the use of different modems to increase the contrast. Con- uh, contrast. Not only that, we have to also manipulate the pH to increase the constant. The, see, the constant primary depends on the tissue dye extract binding. More the degree of affinity of the tissue for the plant extract dye, more will be the contrast. If there will be less affinity, then the contrast will be less. Now, in order to increase this con- consta- uh, contrast, now it, it depends on the, the temperature at which we are standing, the pH of the solution, use of mordants, then extraction. Since this, this is a very vast field, and in fact, it is a, uh, it takes a lot of time during working. So we have to keep on working to ultimately come to a conclusive staining method, which gives most appropriate contrast with the most appropriate result. These are all the studies are very, very rudimentary and preliminary stage. Yes, sir, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think a lot of work is to be done in this field. Yes. You are like... Dr. Vikadesh, I have one question. Yes, please. Yeah, this is Dr. Laksh. Sir. 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 sir, Dr. Mishra ji. Yes, the yes, maturity sir. of the cells does it have it's any association with the uh, color intensity of the cells? Uh, sir, I could not actually, uh, your voice break, uh, broke midway. I could not get the uh, completely hear your question. Can you please repeat? Yeah, the maturity of the stains. The ma- role ma- of the... Yes, yes. Uh, maturity of the stain, actually, one more thing I want, I forget to write actually. Sir, one more important point is that at what age of the plant we are collecting the particular part. It can be this, we saw that the color can come from any part of the tissue. It can be the stain, it can be the bark, it can be the flower, it can be the leaf, it can be the fruit, or it can be the seed. So it also depends that at what age of the plant, at what stage of ripening of the fruit, or at what stage of the flowering, we are collecting these plants. And also in our laboratory, after dye uh, this uh, extraction, how we are allowing a maturation period, as you have pointed, these are all the points need to be, needs a great experimentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your sir. valuable presentation, uh, sir. Sir, I have one more question in YouTube, sir. Hmm. Sir, please. Uh, sir, that uh, Dr. Tomar, sir. Yeah. Uh, already we are running out of time. Hmm? Please, uh, please post in the chat box. Dr. Sir, if you can just put me in one in one sentence, I can clarify. Instead of going to YouTube, can you just put in one minute? Just uh, within one minute, I will be able to clarify. Can you, Dr. Tomar, please? Can you prompt this question? Yes, sir. The question is actually that the hmm. large staining technique. What you have shown, sir. The few hmm. the few cells are getting stained. Have you tried for any other method for identification of the cell? Like what cells are taking that particular stain, sir? That is the question. Which, which one I could not get gone? Most of the? Sir, in the last technique, what you have shown that you are uh-huh. saying, because of IPR, you are not sharing that plant name and all. Uh-huh. In that, have you tried any other staining technique to identify the cell which are taking your stain? That is what we are working, Dr. Sav. That is what I said. We are working on it. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. I, I, I understand working- that uh, I... IPA concept, sir. Ah, yeah, yeah. I, we are trying to characterize what those cells could be. Yes, we are yes, working sir. on it. Thank I you. Thank satisfy, you uh, I think this answer satisfies the uh, query of the asker, sir. So, uh-huh. further question in YouTube, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your presentation, sir. Uh, now, I request uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. M. Lakshman, sir. Please, the uh, Share your screen, sir. Please start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jaji. Thank you, Dr. Sir.
Uh, yeah, could you able to see the screen, sir? Yeah, yes. sir. Yes, 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 visible. Visible, no? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very good morning to everyone. And uh, thank you for organizers giving me this opportunity. And this is not from my laboratory. This is from the other laboratory. It is a real-time image of mitochondria, how they are working and how they are communicating each other. So with this, uh, I will just enter with the other presentation, which is assigned to me. <coughs> Is it visible, sir? Sir, it is visible. It is yeah. visible, sir. Yes, thank, you, thank you so much. Yeah, I started just uh, now. We we'll go back. So, actual presentation is uh, my electron microscopy area. So, I want to touch ongoing activities. So, how, how were the science and technology in the past? The dog has been sent to the space. Now, people have sent a rocket uh, to touch the outer orbit of the, the corona of the sun, or you can say the solar system. And previously, you can say the diagnosis of the disease or uh, research activities is a group of people are going to use with this is a, is a mentally Ill, Ill person as per the, uh, what to call, uh, article. So now the science has developed from this stage to the a CRISPR therapy level, or it gets the microsurgery to the uh, DNA or so on, and which can be used for the control of the elements. So despite of that, despite of that, we have a problem with the COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Is, uh, now, the previously, the Spanish flu, only two things, non-medical practices were put into practice and publications are different. There's a physical distance and the wearing of the mask. And the present day, the entire globe is masked with the, the a simple surgical mask. And the people are maintained in the social distance. That is the reason why we are not looking at uh, each other physically and we are not in a position to do the things. So actually, before entering into subject, I would like to mention how the cell is associated with the globe. The entire universe, if you look at that, the entire globe is with the, uh, what you call 70% water and 30% is land. The 30% land is typically associated with all elements, including the pathogens, non-pathogens, and human being, all uh, biostrata is uh, with the 30% land. Uh, the similar fashion, you can see that uh, same thing is being prevailing in the cells. So all these articles, whatever I just focused in the references, go to the review articles. They have stated that more or less 70% is water and 30% is the other subcellular contents. So the subcellular contents are the one which are the culprits or the biggest organ in the body like interstitium, which is playing a major role in communicating the, what to call the pathogens or surpassing the pathogens in the nearby cells in the vicinity of the cells or so on. So now just to go back to the Hippocrates, uh, uh, a popular uh, saying is, uh, declare the past and diagnose the present and foretell the future. Now this is the biggest challenge throughout the globe, or the global challenge in the present scenario of the COVID-19 or otherwise forthcoming uh, genotic important diseases. They are ahead, we have to be alert with that. And throughout the globe, this is only one available Transmission electron microscopy, color imposed electron microscopy, 3D image. And wherein all these, uh, what you call cell organelles, are being focused in a different colors. And all cell organelles are the double membrane, boundary. They have their own specified functions with the specified location. Look at this uh, nucleus, how the nucleoplasma is there, chromatin material is inside. The nuclear force and the cytoskeleton system, you can see the microtubules. Dr. Lakshmi, yes, sir. Ah. Sorry to interfere, but we are not getting your screen. Only that mitochondria video slide is visible, sir. Uh, audience? Oh, sorry, sorry. It is not uh, visualized? Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, only mitochondria. Uh, the video, uh, what you played, sir, that is only visible, sir. Now it is okay? You have to share your screen. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes, I have. Yeah, I, yeah now it is. Now it is. No, sir, actually, your screen is not uh, visible. I'm just you have to it. share your screen again, sir. Yes, I'm making it, sir. I'm sharing the. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, is it okay, sir? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Yeah, visible, sir, uh, 
please put in powerpoint mode sir powerpoint mode only it is in powerpoint mode ah, right. and now yeah, it is yeah, slide yeah. show ah, yeah, now yeah, it's okay it now okay. i just brush up yeah it is a olden days it is 80s and before that how the science was the present day science is touching the orbit outer orbit or a corona of the sun and the information what we are getting is different and the previous olden days how the diagnosis is being made and the disease is being addressed and the present days we have a crispr therapy level at a the uh, what to call the dna microsurgery level and the previously we have influenza like number of episodes where in the mask is protecting the people nowadays also the entire globe is being protected by the mask and the physical distance and look at this as the globe is made up of 70% water and 30% land in the 30% land human being all elements are the pathogens non pathogens are they have a congregation similar phenomena is retained with the cell whether it is a human cell animal cell plant cell or even the pathogens they have a more or less 30% is only the other stuff and 70% is water and the interstitial is going to be play major role in communicating the disease how to call the process and uh, this uh, is a hippocrates uh, a, a, a popular uh, what to call uh, saying is that uh, declare the past diagnose the present and foretell the future this is the biggest challenge to the entire scientific community in the globe to address the issue which is going on there is a covid 19 and this is a one of the important uh, what to call uh, cell model in the world so far is been published in the very good journal is a cryoelectron microscopy database uh, is a world first what to call the inside the color all images are uh, all cell organelles are given the different colors so we all know that about the different uh, cell organelles and their functions and uh, how it is being uh, associated with uh, each other so here they have a designed a specific designed assignment by the nature and they are being placed in a different position in the cell uh, what to call the cell in the cytosol and they execute its uh, design function only they don't interfere with each other i look at this is a nucleus area and you can see the different uh, what to call the chromatin material nuclear core double membrane of the nucleus mitochondria crispr and the uh, what to call the mitochondrial matrix and the cytoskeletal system and other cell organelles are there in this uh the in the process of the disease or in the process of the normal metabolism all these are going to execute its function in a designed manner without interfering with each other and uh, with this uh, i have an experience for the past uh, 10 to 12 years or 13 years uh working with the electron microscopy handling of different types of samples from the different institutions or the different research activities and the diagnosis material from the different parts of india and we all know that there is a number of tools are available number of tools are available in the society to diagnose the disease or to advance the science and technology as the previous speaker was saying something about the uh, what to call the staining material staining methods or so and we have that with the light microscopy we can do lot many things uh, as it has mentioned over here and electron microscopy over and above over and above uh, we can uh, peep into the cell and see that how the structural disintegration is been taken place or how they are working in normal physiological manner or so we have other uh, accessories to the compound microscope to visualize something with the dyes as the previous speaker was saying something about the color intensity are on now we have the fluorescent dyes to uh, tag with the required material like for example is a mitochondria can be tagged a number of mitochondria for a given field can be analyzed so this is the basic idea of any basic science particularly anatomy pathology and the diagnostic aspect all the microscopy facility are being used and this technique is being uh, supported by the ancillary techniques like flow cytometry pcr and other uh, uh, what to call the dna based techniques are available so in the review article it has been clearly mentioned that how one technique is ancillary to the other technique and the, the basic technique how it takes the uh, help of the other ancillary techniques uh, in the process of the disease diagnosis so with this i would like to mention something about the experimental transmission electron microscopy whatever we have received as my topic is connected with the research and diagnosis so this is one of the cell of the mitochond uh, sorry the alpha cell of the pancreas look at this in normal way how does a nucleus appears to be look at the inner and outer nuclear membrane the chromatin material uniformly distributed and nucleoplasma is a granularity can be seen and the mitochondria is there and they, they see the uh, what to call endoplasmic reticulum how it is attached with the outer membrane of the nuclear uh, envelope so previous slide you just come back you will come to know the things so that was 
color in poles and is a normal way you get the black and white color and uh, look at the other area this is a cell or junction or the area it is a normal way it looks like a, a tight junction or so desmosomes are so on but it's not so prominent over here and in this cell we'll find the endoplasmic reticulum how it is being arranged in a normal way with the smooth endoplasmic reticulum here and the rough endoplasmic reticulum over here and rough endoplasmic reticulum over here and we'll find the mitochondria here and there right so this is a one it's a hepatocyte where it's a pathological hepatocyte where the nuclear changes have been secured and uh, margination of the chromatin irregularly taken place uh, with the nucleolus in the center is a, a plain cyto, what you call a nucleoplasma and a dilated nuclear pore. So nuclear pore is supposed to have a communication system in the physiological manner, but in the pathological way, it has been dilated. The intrusion usually takes place from the cytosol, it, which was entered by cross barrier of the cell membrane and it may cause the damage to the communication system. So in the cytosol, we'll find number of numerous what the fat bodies and the distorted mitochondria here and there is a electron, little translucent and electron dense material is there. A various in the shape and size of the fat globules or you can say the dense, what you call the electron dense material. And we'll find something like a, a vesicles, a, a small vesicles which are there, which is being distorted in this particular slide. And this slide, uh, we can find uh, here is a, is a something like a, is a, the difficulty to uh, recognize the cellular changes, which cell belongs to which organ. Of course, it's an experimental. It is from the LIBO. We'll find that these are distorted cells with the uh, compressed, uh, what you call the cell showing the mitochondria over here. Uh, sorry, the endoplasmic reticulum over here, mitochondria here. You see the things here. We have the intracellular junction. It's the desmosomes. It's a very black and tight junctions are there. The nucleus is being under change. Uh, this uh, thin nuclear membrane will be seen and with a thick, uh, uh, what you call uh, nucleoplasma, uh, uh, nucleolus in the center, here you can find. And the nucleoplasma is a much more granularity with the swollen mitochondria and distorted the structure and the shape of the mitochondria. Similar way, you'll find the granularity of the cytosol. In this another slide, you can another uh, picture, you'll find that, you find that it is a, a, a nucleus showing a small amount of the nucleo, nucleolus and more granular nucleoplasma with the mild dilatation of the nuclear membrane and the communication system with the outer nuclear membrane with the endoplasmic reticulum is totally distorted. It's all the clumping of the endoplasmic reticulum and the condensed mitochondria with the little electron dense appearance. The cytosol is showing a small particles like electron dense fat like bodies. And in this slide, we'll find a, a thick, uh, what you call nuclear membrane and a nucleolus and a granular nucleoplasma and altered mitochondria. Only the granularity, it is all like uh, Christi have been lost, outer inner membranes are not in a position to distinguish, and it is like a, is a matrix have been granularity is there. And the cytosol looks like is a more of the, the plain area, and it is a vesicle are collapsed or so on. This is a membrane structure, is the internal membrane is being disturbed. In this, uh, we'll find the alpha cells of the pancreas. The vesicles are showing the numerous, the different size and shape, and we find here and there it is not so prominent in the plasmic reticulum compared to the beta cells. In this, uh, it is uh, experimentally, it, it is like a distorted alpha cell having a different variation shape and size of the it's a secretions. Maybe amylase, dipsin, or so on and so forth. It has to be ancillary technique will support us what sort of molecules they are. And here is a beta cell is showing a, a small amount of the, the, the the granules are different in size. These are all the insulin granules synthesized or secreted in the beta cells. And we'll find the numerous vesicles over here and tartars of appearance of the R, these uh, jigjag appearance of the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum with the intact cell membrane. In the another image, we'll find that similar granules, but the size of the vesicles are different. And uh, the dilatation of the endoplasmic reticulum is a little bit uh, uh, pronounced than the this, uh, what you call the third image, the fourth image is a little bit different. And if this image is showing, it is a stomach uh, secretory epithelial cells. The nuclear changes you just uh, compare. Here it is like a little electron uh, translucent and it's a less amount of dense material. Here it is much more electron dense material. It all depends upon the protein content of this particular material. In the center, we'll find uh, the, these are the mitochondria, which are the distorted mitochondria. No structural details are being seen. And these all the dilated, uh, you can see the, the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, there is a Golgi saccules here and there will find in a different way. And this is the mitochondria. And 
In a similar way, you see the same thing, the secretory epithelial cell of a nucleus, more amount of the nuclear material is a from chromatin material, which is uh, blocks of chromatin material is uh, arranged in a, in a, in a, in a, in a what you call margination manner, margin, margining or margination of the chromatin material, the disturbed uh, nucleolus and granular, what you call a nucleoplasma, dilated uh, inner outer nuclear membrane, you can see. The communication is remained, but the com communication in the endocrine, neuroendocrine way, it gets altered, thereby the, the, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is under hypoplasia and the dilatation appearance, the sacular appearance is there. And the cytosol will find this uh, uh, vesicles or the kids, the vacuoles that get collapsed and become a, a very big vacuolar appearance is there in this image. And another image is showing, another image is showing uh, like it's an electron dense mitochondria. It's a structure, shape, size is totally altered because of altered cytosol pH. And uh, here we'll find uh, uh, what you call uh, electron uh, uh, disturbance. Uh, the, uh, a line-like structure, they're all endoplasmic reticulum. These are all endoplasmic reticulum, how does it make it? And uh, this is a, a vesicle, it is showing like a double membrane, supposed to be, but it is a, a thick membrane appearance and dilatation of the nuclear pores will find. So leakage of the things will be there in two or two and fro. So that makes the total collapse of the cell in a due course if the pathogen is continuously proliferating in the cell. Uh, <coughs> This is another cell. You can find this is a trucks. We have made a section. The lymphocyte is a beautiful way. It is giving a more amount of the less amount of the cytosol, more amount of the nucleus. This is the macrophage is a deep indentation of the nucleus can be seen with a very good uh, placement of the chromatin material. But other cell organelles are in this in this picture in this particular slide. So next slide is like a elephant. Uh, what do you call? Uh, uh, skin and this is a basale is being seen. This is received from the northeast to state. And these are the from the uh, what to call uh, NRC meat. Uh, you can find this uh, light band and dark bands of the uh, uh, muscle. So we know the things uh, in between how the nucleus and the mitochondria is being placed. In this, we'll find the very clear nucleus and the nucleus and the mitochondria in the vicinity. So it all depends upon the the work nature of the individual cell, work nature of the a compound, the, the group of cells, uh, how the organ gets built and uh, uh, get reduced, that's the size and weight usually being, being correlated. This is cell lines from the different uh, experimental studies. The indentation of the nucleus is a cancer cell lines and the distortion in the mitochondria. It's a round structure, it's a small condensed and it is a, a normal appearance. It is a deviation in the size of the, it all depends on the assignment given to the particular component how they are behaving in the cytosol. The cytosol is a total granular, very much uh, uh, appreciable and a little uh, electron dense particles are there in this. And there is a lot of distortion is there with the mitochondria and the nuclear membrane and the nucleolus. There is no proper, uh, what to call uh, placement and the granular nucleoplasma is a very much prominent in this. So in this slide, we'll find that large number of vesicles and the mitochondria. To be a beginner, it's difficult to, to understand the vesicle and the mitochondria. So, so in the vesicular mitochondria also give a very uh, wrong interpretation. This is a vesicular mitochondria, it's ongoing on. The, the changes are going on. This is a vesicle, for example. All these are the small, what you call the particles, uh, there is a like the vesicles, and the nuclear changes have been triggered a lot, and it gives a very electron dense material. This all the turtles' appearances, there is all a, like a phagosome. So, we can say the autophagy appearance. Uh, it's the ones uh, there are defense mechanisms. We all know that uh, how the cell will undergo with its own defense. This is a one material we have received from the supported by the ancillary technique. The previous slide I just mentioned. Most of the things have to be interdependent. No technique is independent, and no technique is a uh, superior and inferior. They are all they have their own weight tendency. You see these uh, like uh, microfilaments are being tagged with the dye. In the electron microscopy, we'll find this is all the uh, microfilaments is abundant in nature. Apart from the previous slide, what we have seen the phagosomes and the nuclear changes. So this is a, like a, a cross section of the tail. This is one of the experimental studies of PhD student from the veterinary biology, Rajendra Nagar, uh, Department of Gynecology. We make a section and we see the mitochondrial changes in the uh, given experimental sperm. This is the illustration I have collected to understand, better understanding for the beginners or the youngsters, uh, how the mitochondria looks like in the outer area of the 
what we call the, the cross section of the tail. So as for the diagnosis, there's a few slides I just mentioned and a few slides related, uh, uh, related with the diagnostic electron microscopy. And this is a hard area in gland, the nucleus, which is uh, suffering with the ILT infection, which was confirmed by the other techniques, including the uh, what you call uh, uh, a PCR technique. It was found positive for ILT virus, ILTV, and uh, the nuclear changes are very much triggered. It's a very big block of chromatin material. Dilatation is being seen, and there is a distortion in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and the mitochondrial changes can be seen. And uh, here and there in the cytosol, we'll find the white, uh, what to call uh, small vesicular structures. In the next slide, I can show you the virus particles, how does they look like. These are the virions, or the virus particles are there, VLPs, we usually say. These are the vesicles, these are the VLPs. So this has to be properly distinguished under electron microscopy. Experience will make the man to learn many things. So nucleus, you can see the nucleus over here, nuclear membrane, very much thin. It's a completely distorted nucleus, a disappearing nucleus. The, in the pathology, we usually say, of course, anatomy people will also know that how the cell death during the process of the cellular changes and the nuclear changes, uh, the rexis and other things usually been seen in this. And uh, this is a, a blood vessel, micro blood vessel is a severe condition, nucleated erythrocytes in the uh, what you call dilated area. And you'll find this is a uh, epithelial cells are showing a uh, minute structures like uh, what you call the virus particles. Is a dilated or uh, of appearance or disappearance, or you can say, a, a wire like appearance of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You find here it is a very clear that is a, like a, uh, uh, the autophagy. Uh, it is one of the different systems usually being seen. You can find the, uh, it's a, it's a ER autophagy. And these are the, what you call, uh, 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 particles like a VLPs over here. And the VLPs are being uh, prominently seen at the little uh, lower mat, of course. You find this is a, a clumping of all the uh, pathogens over here. By the micro uh, capillary showing a dilatation and uh, a nucleated erythrocytes is a completely distorted, uh, uh, what to call a pycnotic nuclei of epithelial cell of the cheek here. You find this is the micro villi, the higher level. These are all the virus particles. An ongoing uh, COVID 19 is attaching with this and entry. There's all those things are a bit different. Uh, I may not uh, much emphasize on that. So to appreciate the civil structure in the surface area. So during the process of the disease, usually pathogen usually attached with this in some application, not in all. And they try to enter into the cell and the cytosol and the machinery, which is there already being intact. There's a protein synthesis, how does it take place? Let's try to hazard that and make use of that particularly uh, the machinery and its proliferation. It is IV virus. It is being confirmed by the PCR. It's all the virus particles, VLPs can be appreciated over here. Here it is like a dilated, what you call endoplasmic reticulum, previous that I have just focused in the dilated system, all the particles are being entered and they are proliferating inside. They are proliferating inside. And this all cell showing a, a nucleus completely distorted. It's a nuclear material is crumpled and uh, margination of the chromatin material. It is a dying, what to call the cell it is showing. And the cytosol is exhibiting numerous particles of the IV virus. This IV virus are being again diagnosed by the PCR technique. Here, uh, the, the same thing, IV virus, it is a necropathy usually. See the cell junction. And the previous slides I have just mentioned about the cell junction is a very tight cell junction. So this is very block in nature. And the, the cytosol is uh, very much uh, what to call uh, vanished. And the virus particles are there in the vicinity of the nuclear membrane. The nuclear Excuse membrane me, is sir. condensed. Uh, sorry, sorry for the interruption, sir. Yeah, please. Sir, sorry for the interruption. Could, could yeah. you please uh, speed up the presentation, sir, because we are limited by time. I'll just finish. I'll just finish. I'll just finish, OK? Hello? OK. Sir, you, Okay. Sir, okay, sir, right. Okay, sir. Yeah, these are the just particles. I'll just focus on a few, few more sites and finish, okay? So you can see the virus particles in the cytosol and nuclear changes. So I want to simulate that whatever I have seen this, it is a similar to that of the a coronavirus, which is being seen in the dilated uh, endoplasmic reticulum So it is not my work. It is a downloaded work with the permission. It's one of the outbreak is going on there in both the Telangana, what you call Telugu states. It's a, 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 a LSD is a, what you call uh, lumpy skin disease virus. It gives a hourglass appearance. Uh, we are working on this now. So this is a pox virus. How does it looks like? Uh, these are the, what you call the okay. examples, how the things are there. So the time factor, I'm just focusing uh, somewhat, uh, these are thin memory disorder, how the memory is very much thin. 
right sir these are the virus particles attached with the surface area of the uh, cell lines or so so these are the maps uh, on electron uh, protocol uh, the various particles of the natural outbreaks cross sections or so so i just escape sir i think i want to finish up the, i want to put the full stop over here right ekal me wo ek ek please sir it is open to the the the, the yeah thank you please i want to stop over here sir ek to yaad to nahi bahut acha orator rahega ya phir पार्टिसिपेंट तो बहुत पहले रिटायर हो गया अभी कहां रिटायर हो रहा डॉक्टर अजय प्रकाश सर प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सर ओके ओके सॉरी योर अनम्यूट प्लीज म्यूट योर सर इज देर एनी क्वेश्चन ओके विल मूव ऑन टू नेक्स्ट प्रेजेंटेशन थैंक यू सर थैंक यू लक्ष्मण सर मुनमुन शर्मा मैडम प्लीज प्लीज शेयर योर स्क्रीन Yes, sir. I'm sharing my screen. So yeah, good yeah, afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon to all. Very happy to be with you to deliver my presentation on a little different topic. It's on uh, wildlife forensic and crime control. So the topic of my deliberation is role of veterinarians in wildlife crime control. So this is a quote by given by famous chemist uh, uh, Paul Elke. Let me read out. Uh, ma'am, your video is not visible, ma'am. Hi. Yes. Your your video is not visible. One minute. One minute. Ekam. 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 Video to our lady was a side issue. So one minute, sir. I'm taking help. Video to Hana will go, sir. After two minutes. So is it clear, sir? No, ma'am. Actually, uh. your presentation is visible but uh, your video is not visible but video is on sir no okay, your okay, self on the screen on the zoom screen your presentation is visible yes sir please click on the start video stop video button okay. Or maybe I've closed your camera on the laptop. Camera is on, sir. Camera is you on. You can't see me, na, sir. You, you please uh, click on the uh, uh, video button, ma'am. Just one minute, sir. Stop screen problem, ma'am. Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to stop screen problem. You two, ma'am, put the display on. Ma'am, I'm downloading the display. Tell me, sir, ma'am, up or down? Can you enable, sir? ये ऐसा इतना ऊपर की नहीं ठाकरे थे क्या? 
Slides are visible. So like this, am I visible? Slides are visible, slides. Ma'am, please put in uh, uh, slideshow mode, ma'am. No, then I can't see, sir. I can't see the full slide. It's covered by the bar. So I actually... Shall I present this way, sir? Shall I present this way? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It happens okay, with some others also. You can present okay, this way. Please go present. ahead, madam. Even if yes, you are yes. not able to see your, your video, please go ahead. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir, for the disturbance. So topic is role of veterinarians in wildlife crime control. This is some way away from my subject, but still then I'll be coming back again. This is a quote from Paul L. Crick, sir. Let me read out this quote, then everyone will understand what is wildlife forensic. Wherever he steps, whatever he touches, whatever he leaves, even unconsciously, will serve as a silent witness against him. Not only his fingerprints or his footprints, but his hair, the fibers from his clothes, the glass he breaks, the tool mark he leaves, the paint he scratches, the blood or cement he deposits or collects. All of these and more bear muted, mute weakness against him. This is evidence that does not forget. It is not confused by the excitement of the moment. It is not absent because human witnesses are. It is factual evidence. Physical evidence cannot be wrong. It cannot perjure itself. It cannot be wholly absent. Only human failure to find it, study and understand it can diminish its values. We know that India is a mega diverse country with only 2.4% of world's landmark area and accounts for seven to 8% of all the recorded species, including over 45,000 species of plants and 91,000 species of animals. If we see the forest cover, it is 7,12,249 square kilometer, which is only 21.67% geographical area of India. If we see the forest cover of different states, then Meghalaya records the highest with 77,482 square kilometers, followed by Arunachal Pradesh with 66,688, least being Uttarakhand to 24,303 square kilometers. If we see the major wildlife population of India, then and its distribution state-wise, we can find that Madhya Pradesh records the highest in tiger population with 526, then Karnataka with elephant population of 6,049, followed by Madhya Pradesh in leopard population of 1,817, and Gujarat being the only state having 674 leopards. If you see the statewide distribution, the South Indian states of Karnataka, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu are home to nearly 44% of the elephants. 35% of tigers and 31 of the leopards in India. Karnataka alone is the home to 22% of the elephant, 18% of tiger and 14% of leopard in India. If we come back to Northeast India, we find that Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, Mizoram, Meghalaya, Tripura together with West Bengal accounts for 30% of elephants and 5% of the tiger population and the state of Gujarat is the only state with 100% of Asiatic lion population. Information regarding other states are not available. Now, if we want to know what is wildlife crime, it is interpreted as wildlife crime is contravening any domestic or international law concerning wildlife. What is wildlife? Then we should understand that any animal or aquatic land vegetation which forms part of any habitat. Now, the illegal trade in wildlife goes in hand in hand with narcotics and arms trade as the offenders are only interested in making big money quickly, thereby making it one of the largest illegal occupation in the world. Different natures of wildlife crime, if you want to know that the first is the damage to the habitat destruction, then trespassing the protected areas, cruelty to the wild animals, violation of rules, possession of wildlife trophies, hunting or fishing of wild animals, domestic trade of wildlife trophies, import export of wildlife trophies, which is called 
smuggling. What is the reason behind wildlife? Illegal wildlife trade is driven mainly by human. Profits earned by the traders, low risk, low penalty, make the trade highly lucrative. Unlike other con conventional crimes, no stigma is attached to the offenders who commit wildlife crime. And many people are fond of wearing ornaments of wildlife. These are some of the points. Then keeping skin or horns or antlers, uh, antlers is a status symbol in many families. And cultural belief or even superstitious beliefs are other factors driving the illegal trade in wildlife and their parts and products. It is very surprising to know that illegal wildlife trade nets approximate 20 billion US dollars a year worldwide, which is more profitable than sale of illicit liquors and weapons. Hence, wildlife poaching, trading and trafficking is more lucrative business. A poacher can earn 1,000 US dollars a gram, which is 20 times the profit of heroin. In Brazil, illicit drug sale is combined with wildlife trade, which is more attractive to criminals because weight to weight wildlife trade is more profitable than drugs or arms and with less associated risk. Wildlife forensic, as we know, is a field of criminal investigation wherein the scientific uh, knowledge regarding its, its applied to identify and examine evidence from time since where animals have been killed, particularly those that have been protected by law. Wildlife forensic plays a crucial role in curtailing the wildlife trade and human wildlife conflict. Now, forensic investigation is the observation or inquiry into allegations, circumstances, or relationships in order to obtain factual information and make certain whether or not a violation of any rule has been committed. This is the most important role of veterinarian is their contribution towards the wildlife crime control and veterinarians play this role by converting the clues collected from the scene of crime into evidence admissible in the court of law, proper investigation of forensic samples provided by the forest department, police department, etc., and submit the report to the court for conviction of the convicts the diagnosis of diseases upon post-mortem examination, maintaining post-mortem protocol. There is lacuna in this, uh, this part always. I am not talking about uh, the uh, scenario in nationwide, but this is what's happening in, the, in Assam and Northeast. So my friends, please be careful while dealing with forensic samples. Then wildlife forensic provide scientific evidence for investigation of wildlife crimes and mainly focus on identifying the illegal trades or poached wildlife products. Now, some of the parameters that are considered in identification of wild animals, these are morphology and morphometry where the role of the anatomist comes. We know that anatomists are the best biologists in the world. The next is chemical test from the crime scene, then DNA profiling, and meat analysis. Morphology and morphometry here, the forensic veterinary experts compare the shape and size of the objects, exhibits or trophies, and try to analyze the data collected from the crime scene to summarize and submit to the court of law. And morphometric study, as we all know, it is actually retaining the size information in analysis. Now, chemical evidence can be any chemicals collected from suspect or victimized animals or various objects or solutions from available from the crime scene or are recovered from the related areas. If we say DNA profiling, it is another area of study by which the forensic experts can authenticate valuable information connected to species identification to solve the wildlife crimes. Meat analysis is another challenging approach of forensic science to solve various federal legal or medical legal cases. Now, myself being more or less involved in wildlife forensic, it is a very tough time for me to deal with forensic, forensic materials, as I will show you later on. And regarding this DNA profiling, this is not done in our states, which we need to outsource. And this outsourcing is a very, very costly business. You know, sometimes these forensic samples used to come to me or to our department for their identification. I'm just showing you a few examples, two examples. This is a biological sample. It was sent to me 
on the 2nd uh, December 2013. This was from the SP Udalgiri, and they have confiscated these bones from the smuggler, international smuggler, and these smugglers were trying to sell out these bones as the bones of diminutive man, which is uh, having high value in the international gray market. So they wanted to really know the species of the bow, I mean, uh, this animal. Then they, it was sent to me and upon study with my colleagues, what we have found that this is from the AV species. These are the large metal tarsal bones. So these were they, these international smugglers, they used to cheat in the gray market also. Then another set of bone, it came from the Assistant Commissioner Custom Division, Karim Ganj, that is a, 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 a district from Assam, where they wanted to know the species of these bones. Upon study, because we have got collection of bones of uh, tiger, then leopard, black panther. So we have compared these bones and we have identified that these bones are from Indian leopard. So in coming to the histological study of hair, why we are preferring as uh, forensic experts, why hair is most preferred tissue in wildlife crime investigation. We know that hair is among the most often collected and potentially useful types of types because hair is chemically most stable. It resists putrefaction and retains its morphological characters for a long time. Information about animal is readily apparent from a simple microscopical examination of hair. Microscopic image analysis provides a useful tool for forensic identification of the examined species. Hair is important because hair retains their uniqueness despite of processing like aging, digestion, change in environment, which is important for forensic investigations. We know that we have the hair samples, what we have collected in our department, what we have, we are trying to make a database with this. And these hair samples were processed as part of technique advocated by Bureau of Police and Research Development 2000. Then the hair, the different parameters that were studied are medullary pattern, diameter of medulla, medullary index, and cortical medullary index for the ease of species identification. And uh, formally for these calculation where medullary index is equal to M divided by D, where is M? M is the diameter of medulla, and D is the diameter of the hair shaft. Cortical medullary index is equal to C into 100 divided by M. Here C is the thickness of the cortex, M is the diameter of the medulla and all these were uh, photographs and micrometry were done with the help of the Leica microscope with image analysis system. Biological values, biometrical values were statistically analyzed as per Snedeker and Pora 1994. So looking into this uh, schematic diagram, we know that hair has, uh, shaft of hair has got three structures. Innermost is the medulla surrounded by the cortex and this is the outermost cuticular, cuticular layer, which uh, comprises of cells that appear as fish scales, scales of fish. Now, if we say that different types of medulla, as by literature, they are of four types, either fragmented, if the medulla are present this way, it is fragmented or interrupted. If there are interrupted in between, this is continuous hub and in some animals, we do not get medulla, here medulla is absent. So if we say the medullary pattern in this table, we can see the continuous type of medulla. You see, medulla of all these species have got continuous type of medulla. Then we find this type of medulla, multi serial ladder type. This is found in rabbit. Rabbit has got two type of hair, coarse hair and fine hair. The coarse hair medulla is multi serial type. And then uniserial type of medulla is found in fine hair of rabbit and fine hair of rat. Then we find globular type of medulla. This is globular type. This is found in barking deer. And this is wide eriform lattice type of medulla found in rat corset. I have already shown you that rat fine hair is uniserial type and multiserial. This uh, you, wide uniform lattice is present in the coarse hair of rat. Then this is narrow eriform ladder type of medulla. This is fine, found in the fine hair of yak. So these are some of the 
medullary pattern which I want to show you. This is from the deer family, barking deer, hog deer, spotted deer, sumper deer. So you see, if you compare, these are all having globular type of uh, medulla, but there is difference in their pattern. Indian boar is also having this globular type of medulla. If you see Asian elephant, it is absent. Indian rhinoceros, it is present and it is continuous type. This is the medulla of feral horse, it is continuous type. Wild buffalo, continuous type. Ciro is having med this medulla, it is more or less globular, but it, the white of the medulla is narrow if compared with the cortical thickness. Now this table is showing some of my works that were done. And we have taken into account these parameters like type of medulla, medulla diameter, cortical thickness, hair shape diameter, medulla in the medullary index and cortical medullary index. Clouded leopard, clouded leopard, coarse hair, fine hair, common leopard, Bengal tiger, Bengal tiger, white hair. It has got two types of hair, brown and white. Then elephant rhino, sorry, elephant is not having medulla in other animals. Uh, these are continuous and these are the biometrical values or micro, micrometrical values that have been put into mean plus minus standard error. So in this next table, this is the continuation. We have studied the medullary pattern of pygmy hog, mithun, yak coarse, yak fine hair. So these four, they are showing continuous type of medulla. Rabbit coarse hair is showing multi-serial type of medulla. Rabbit fine uniserial type of medulla. Red coarse hair, it is white ediform. Lattice type, red fine uniserial ladder, then barking their globular. These are the micrometrical values, that is medullary diameter, cortical thickness, hair shape diameter, medullary index, and cortical medullary index. In the next table, we are taking into account the coarse hair of guinea pig. It is continuous, fine hair of guinea, guinea pig is narrow, ediform. Then we have also taken some of the domestic animals just for comparison. Coarse hair of dog, it is continuous. Fine hair of dog is continuous. Megala local peak continuous. Assam local peak continuous. Swamp buffalo continuous type of medulla. Now, if we do the interpretation, we find that there are six different types of medullary pattern found, like continuous, multi serial ladder, uni serial ladder, globular, white ediform lattice, and narrow ediform lattice. Out of these 16 different species that have been taken into account, the coarse hair of 13 species showed continuous medullary pattern, such as hair of clouded leopard, common leopard, Bengal tiger, rhinoceros, pygmy hog, mithun, yak, guinea pig, dog, Meghalaya local pig, Assam local, goat, swamp buffalo. When thickness of medulla of all and lowest being in case of clouded leopard, that is 27.35. So these are, these are the biometrical values or micrometrical values that has to be taken into account when any, any anatomist or any veterinarian, they go for forensic analysis. Now, if we come to see the cuticular scale pattern, this is another uh, parameter for species identification. We find in literature that it is of three types, either coronal, you see this is crown-like scales. This is found mostly in rodents. Then spinous type, this is petal-like, and this is found in care. Then imbricate uh, type of, imbricate type of this cuticular scale pattern is common. It is found in, in human beings and many other animals. These are nothing but flattened scales. Let us see our findings. So these are the findings, uh, cuticular scale pattern of some of the herbivores like hog deer, sambar deer, wild buffalo. If you see the cuticular scale pattern, all three are having similar type of cuticular scales that is imbricate. But if you see precisely, it is having some difference in between. And these are the cross sections of the uh, hair shaft. So these are the challenges before VATS actually when we go for wildlife forensics for crime control. First is information. Most of the time accurate and correct information is not provided to the VATS or forensic ex experts to carry out the investigation. Second is technological hindrances. Up-to-date equipments and technologies are not available for wildlife forensics. I'm talking about our part, this part of India. Then manpower. 
due to lack of well trained officials the forensic experts face problem at the time of collection of information evidence materials from the scene of crime then sample preservation another challenge that is collection of appropriate sample in required quantity in proper preservative is highly essential for proper crime investigation more field based innovation in terms of wildlife forensics is need of the hour there has to be a mechanism whereby easy collection of samples quick transfer and analysis is possible then the worst part is this there is that tepism often leads to difficulty in wildlife forensics often there is no proper coordination between the various departments involved in crime control awareness for the requirement and utility of wildlife forensic and lack of proper infrastructure these are the hindrances that are commonly encountered when we go for forensic wildlife forensics and conclusion is that awareness measure to be taken up against wildlife crimes so illegal trade in wildlife will continue as long as there is a demand in the market for it there so there is a need to create awareness and to educate not to use wildlife items protection of wild flora and fauna depends on the strength of synergy between all enforcement agencies awareness supported by coordinated action of all enforcement agencies people's participation and implementation of national and international wildlife law can help the fight against wildlife crime so friends let us join hands to fight wildlife crime so with a quote from paul austin i would like to conclude my deliberation humanity can no longer stand by in silence while our wildlife are being used abused and exploited it is time we all stand together to be the voice of the voiceless before it is too late extinction means gone forever so with these few words i want to conclude but friends when you go for wildlife forensics please be very 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 careful in giving your interpretation because whatever you do whatever you give that is going directly to the court of law because i had to attend court several times uh, regarding all these things so please be careful thank you thank you, thank you ma'am thank you for your valuable presentation on veterinary laws in wildlife crime control uh, now the topic is open for discussion is there any queries from the participants okay ma'am thank you very much is there thank any queries you, you can also post uh, in chat box uh, and thank you sir for uh, giving me the opportunity to give little bit of my input in wildlife forensic thank you so much thank you thank you very much ma'am now thank i request you. the next participant uh, next speaker dr devendra patak yes sir please start your presentation sir sir please unmute yes sure sure just one second sir uh, please finish up by 130 sir right sir right. honorable chairman and the proteer sir of the session and the esteemed participant of this web conference a very good afternoon i thank organizers for providing me an opportunity to present before the learned audience about the topic provided to me or given to me to refer on is the distribution pattern of sex steroid hormone receptors in the tissue of female genitalia and what the significance they lay on the treatment or diagnostic protocols or how it is related to the welfare of the animals so through this uh, topic i'll be highlighting about what steroid hormones are and how the receptors required for their function then through the uh, one by one in the ov ov dot 
uh, how the distribution of these receptors in these tissues. And also we have observed uh, the nuclear and cytosolic reactions. So we'll find out why there are cytosolic expressions also, though they are nuclear receptors, then in uterus, cervix, and little bit in the mammary gland. And we'll try to uh, correlate with their clinical studies where we can apply these. So starting from what the steroid hormones does in the body, they play a central role in regulation of all aspects of the female reproductive activity. They act at the level of hypothalamus, pituitary, ovary, and genital tract. They are also essential for the postnatal mammary gland development. And the effect of all these, uh, these effects of all these uh, hormones are being mediated through their interaction with the specific intracellular receptors. What actually happens when the hormones comes to the cell, which is uh, a effector cell, they enter into it and there are receptors which are mostly nuclear, but there are some cytosolic so if there are uh, cytosolic receptors, they bind them and then they enter into the nucleus. But mostly they are nuclear, so these hormones enter into the nucleus. And then there is a process of binding into the hormone response element before it becomes dimerized. And that the uh, binding of these dimerized hormone receptor element to this response element they start forming mRNA and from there this uh, do go for the protein synthesis and those proteins are the effector proteins to express their function. This is how it works. So if we have receptors, the hormone will act and if they are insufficient, the action will be insufficient and if it is overexpressed, the action will be something non normal. So we'll try to understand how the ER and PR express in the different tissue compartments of the ovary. So what we have observed is from the primordial follicle to the tertiary follicle, and in, in between the connective tissue, stroma cells and blood vessels, all of them has expressed, though differentially in the different stages, but all the compartments are responsive to the hormones by expressing their receptors. And in the two periods of the distinct cyclical phase, that is follicular and luteal, these receptors are more expressed in the follicular phase than the luteal phase uh, because of its role in the, the estrogen hormone's role in its proliferation. So estrogen hormone itself implies to own its receptors to multiply it and they express in different cell types during the follicular phase where there is a estrogen dominant uh, period as compared to the luteal phase. So we have observed a seasonal difference also and in the winter and spring season, the nuclear receptors per unit area or the percentage positive cells which they have expressed during the winter and summer season is significantly higher as compared to the summer and the rainy seasons. Similar with the PR, the PR expressions in all the compartments, including the stroma cell, blood vessels, primordial follicle, primary follicle, secondary follicle, and in the tertiary follicle, both in the granulosa cells and the theca cells. And the stromal cells, which are surrounding the theca cells, has also expressed these receptors. Similar to the estrogen receptors, even the progesterone receptors are more expressed in the follicular phase as compared to the luteal phase. However, there are little uh, less significant difference between the secondary and tertiary follicle uh, in the expression pattern of the PR in follicular and luteal phase. And if we come uh, to learn the distribution pattern, we could try to summarize it. All the compartments of the ovary, starting from the primordial follicle, at least one follicular cells, not the uh, uh, single cell, not the single fo primordial follicle were divided of uh, the ER. So all the primordial follicles, at least one cell is positive. Similarly, in the primary follicle, 
secondary follicle, then tertiary follicle. And in the tertiary follicle or the ovulatory follicle, both the compartment, that is granulosa cell compartment and theca cell compartment were positive for it. And also the atretic follicle. So the atretic, why atretic follicle should go? Because uh, should express this? Because finally the atretic uh, follicle uh, should uh, uh, heal itself to make a scar tissue and for proliferation of those stromal cells, even the atretic follicle, especially the obliterating atretic follicles are expressing these. And not only these follicular compartments, also the interfollicular tissue compartment, which is consisted of the stromal cells and the blood vessels, they are also expressing it. We try to correlate with the expression pattern of PCNA, that is proliferating cell nuclear antigen, and the proliferating cell nuclear antigen expression is directly related to the quantum of the estrogen hormone levels. And that's how it is uh, correlated with proliferation of its own receptors. We also try to learn that whether these estrogen hormones or estrogen receptors they modulate only on the ovarian level or even they modulate at the hypothalamo hypophysial axis level. So we still found, we didn't find the uh, estrogen or progesterone receptors in the hypothalamus of buffaloes, but we did note a, a good percentage of ER and PR positive cells in the pituitary. So we're not sure still, we need to do more research on the hypothalamus to say that there is no long negative feedback which is acting through hypothalamus, but we are pretty sure that it is acting through the hypophysial system. So estrogen hormone goes back to the hypophysis and gives signal whether to increase or decrease the quantum of estrogen hormones. So these different compartments of the ovary. Now coming to the oviduct, Oviduct, all the four uh, segments, that is infundibulum, ampulla, isthmus, and the uterotubal junction. And in all the four compartments, whether it is tunica mucosa or the stroma, epithelium and the tunica mucosa, stroma of the tunica mucosa, then the muscular layer and the serosal layer, all these four compartments, we noted the presence of estrogen receptors. So not only the functional layer, that is the epithelium is expressing it, even the tunica muscularis is expressing it, so that there is a contraction movement to coordinate the uh, function of the tract. And in the tunica mucosa lining epithelium, we observe two characteristic type of cells, that is ciliated cells and the secretory cells. And both these cells, ciliated and secretory, we are ex expressing the estrogen and progesterone hormones. So not only the ciliary movement, it is also the secretory activity of the cells is being guided by these two hormones. So in all the segments in, in fundibulum, if you see the enlarged image, we can see that the ciliated cells and the secretory cells are expressing the nuclear uh, staining for this estrogen and progesterone, estrogen hormones. And the glands at the uh, uterotubal junction, you can see that more than 80% cells in the glands are also positive for the estrogen receptors. And similar to the ovary, even we noted the uh, seasonal variation in the expression pattern of the estrogen receptors. And similar to the ovarian, we also see that these uh, receptors are more expressed during the winter and spring season as compared to the other two seasons. This is how PR localization in all the compartments and in all the uh, cell types, whether it is epithelial cell or it is the stromal cells or it is the glandular cells or the muscle cells or the connective tissue cells of the uh, serosa layer all have expressed differentially though more in the epithelium, more in the glandular epithelium as compared to the stromal cells and then the uh, epithelial cells. So if you want to summarize it, we, we have observed 
these positive cells in both ciliated and secretory cells, then in the stromal cells, in the blood vessels, and also in the muscles. So all the tissue compartments show positive uh, expression of these estrogen and progesterone receptors. Well, uh, we talked about this ERPR in the hypothalamus, how they regulate about it. So similar to the ER, PR were also localized in all the four compartments. And we can see in this image that the uh, secretory cells were more intensely expressing this uh, PR receptor as compared to the ER, saying that the PR is more responsible for the uh, secretory activity, probably larger period of uh, time, they are under the influence of the progesterone hormones. Also, the blood cells, blood vessels, sorry, the uh, expression of these receptors were there. What we observed that we have seen that mostly there were nuclear receptors, but there are also cytosolic expression of these uh, receptors. So we tried to find out why there is cytosolic expression, whether it is there or not. So we uh, did the transmission electron microscopic and through the, uh, the localization of these uh, receptor through the immuno leveling, immuno board leveling method at the transmission electron microscopic level, we observed that these receptors are not only localized in the uh, nucleus, but they are also found in the cytosol at the RER level, mitochondrial level, or in the cilia level. So in all the compartments of the cytosol also, they expressed it uh, in case of the oviduct. Coming to the next segment, that is uterus. Uterus also, there were intense nuclear reaction for these receptors in all the compartments, endometrium, myometrium, and connective tissue of the perimetrium. In the endometrium, the epithelial cells and the lining epithelium of the glands they express intense reaction as compared to the stromal cells, both during the follicular and luteal phase. And we recorded a seasonal variation into it. Maybe it is related to the quantum of hormone, which is circulating in the uh, different seasons. As we noted that it is directly related to the quantum of uh, estrogen hormone, and it is inversely related to the progesterone hormone. And we have noted that the activity of the PCNA is directly correlating with it and that make it uh, sense that the estrogen hormone regulates its own uh, receptors expression patterns. Similar to the ER, PR also observed in all the compartments and to summarize it, we observed in all the compartments, the ex nuclear and little bit cyto cytosolic expression of these receptors in the lining epithelium, in the stromal cells, in the blood vessels, in the glands, and in the muscular layer and connective tissue layer of serosa also. And there was seasonal variation recorded similar to the ovary and oviduct, where we found a higher expression pattern of these receptors in the winter and the spring season as compared to summer and rainy seasons. And the last part of the uh, tract, that is cervix, they were highly influenced by the presence of these uh, hormones. And we can see that in the follicular phase, not even a single cell uh, we can see without the expression of the estrogen receptor. So, which is a little bit lesser in the uh, progesterone dominance phase, that is the luteal phase, but the, the, they are uh, intensely expressing in the follicular phase. So we noted the percentage positive cells and we noted that there is a direct correlation of the dominance of estrogen hormone with that of the proliferation and that proliferative activity was noted by the localization of the proliferating cell nuclear antigen. So in the estrogen dominance phase, there were more expression of the PCNA as compared to that of the luteal phase. In the memory gland, which is also part of the female genital system, based on the studies on the board, we found that the expression of these hormones 
receptors in the glandular compartment, tubular ductular compartment, and also the uh, stromal compartment between the alveoli, they all expressed the ER and PR. There was differential expression in case of the mastitic animals. Differential expression, it was the reduced expression of the ER and PR. So that indicates that the mastitic animal, the, the memory gland is not responding according to the quantum of hormones. And that the expression of the glands, which has tumor-like growth, there were uh, differential expression of these receptors, which were quite higher than that of the normal memory gland. And that was confirmed with the expression of the tumor markers, that is CD10, FNDC, and the MAC1 positive cells. So those glands, which expressed larger quantum of the estrogen receptors, they were directly correlated with the quantum of these tumor marker cells. So that indicates that the higher quantum of estrogen receptor may lead to a cancerous growth. Now coming to the important aspect, what application of these sort of research is. That can be applied uh, in a different area. That is one breeding management, managemental aspect. Uh, we have noted that there are a higher percentage positive cells during the winter season and spring season. Accordingly, we can program up our breeding. Then treatment of obstetrical problems. One of the, after doing my, uh, this sort of research in my department, the gynae department took a problem where they took the biopsy from the obstetrical animals, which has dystochia, and they compared it to the expression of these receptors where there is control group, no dystochia, and the dystochia animals. And they observed that there was reduced number of the estrogen receptors in the animals which were in dystochia condition as compared to the normal ones. So that led to the clue for them that the estrogen priming is required uh, at the time of the parturition uh, before they give the other treatments to relieve the dystopia. So probably they have included it. So that, that was a MSc thesis done in the gynae department uh, uh, in collaboration with our anatomy department. And then uh, one, one of the important aspect of this research is going on to modulate these uh, receptors. We have noted that the progesterone or estrogen is directly related to the uh, health of the animal, if it is lower, the expression will be, the activity will be lower and its expression is very high, then there may be some disease conditions like cancer. So we can modulate that activity if we don't want to function the uterus normally, like we want to control the activity of the organs, we don't want to proliferate it like we want to do spaying, chemical spaying, you can say, or the hormonal spaying. At this case, these selective progesterone receptor modulators are being used, still work is going on uh, in respect to the canines where there is a problem of stray dogs. And for the cancer diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment protocols, the uh, expression pattern or the quantum of ER or PR, they give you an idea about the prognostic uh, activity, what prognosis can be there, larger the ER expression, the prognosis will be poor and so on. So in the, the, those cases, they will advise uh, the treatment protocol based on the prognostic idea. So this, this is the recent work uh, going on across the globe uh, for uh, devising some modulators of the progesterone hormone that can modulate in case of the dog's uterus so that that can be used as a uh, therapy for controlling the fertility in case of dogs. 
in our in our department also we have given work to one msc student who has worked on the expression pattern of these receptors in the normal canines and also in the pyometra complex canines and so we have observed a differential uh, status of these where we have concluded that the er receptors are more expressed in the healthy animals less expressed in the pyometra animals and reverse is the case in case of the pyometra animal so project in the progesterone related thing so progesterone is more expressed in the pyometra animals and that's how the canines are uh, the animals which has been declared as the pyometra led uh, cystic hyperplasia uh, complex so these studies is still going on uh, one msc student is working on this so uh, we have tried to take this uh, basic data towards the application to summarize this these findings so we have recorded a baseline data for the both er and pr over the track we have noted the distribution pattern in the uh, different compartments of these tissues we noted mostly nuclear staining we also observed little bit of the cytosolic staining and we uh, confirmed it through the electron microscopic studies through the immunogold staining and we have noted that in the follicular phase the percentage positive cells are higher than the luteal phase and we have also noted a seasonal difference where we noted that the summer and rainy season has lower activity of these receptors uh, as compared to the winter and spring season in case of memory gland the expression of these receptors are differentially observed during prepubertal lactating and non lactating stage and we have uh, concluded that in the mastitic animals or the disease condition the expression has reduced and in the cancer cases the expression of these receptors are intense and expressed in most of the cells and based on that uh, the people are working my lab is not working on that but uh, the labs are working on recognizing the prognosis uh, of the animal based on the uh, expression pattern of these receptors so the stage related changes in the expression of these receptors were observed in the canine uterus which a uh, student is still working on so our future research to be focused on this area to correlate with the breeding management treatment protocol for obstetrical complications and diseases thank you very much thank you sir thank you for your uh, valuable presentation now now the topic is open for discussion now the topic is open for discussion are is there any queries to ask the questions is there any queries from the participants sir in youtube no question sir okay uh, okay is there any question you can also put in chat box okay thank you sir thank you for your uh, uh, presentation thank you very uh, much sir and thank you organizers for providing me the opportunity to speak before you sir thank you sir and now uh, i request dr raghunath now i request the last uh, speaker of this session dr raghunath dr raghunath Ah, 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 doctor. Sir. Ah, good morning, Raghuna. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, please uh, uh, share your screen. Start yeah. the presentation, please. Raghuna, please finish. Finish up by two o'clock. Yes, sir. Sir, 
my screen is visible sir uh not visible yes sir it is visible now yeah sir. it is visible now okay sir open the powerpoint yeah, yeah. But is it visible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Can I start? It's visible. You put it on the slideshow mode, please. Yeah, yeah. Can I start the presentation? Yeah, yes. You can start. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Respected chairman and the project. The paper is on applications of computerized data literacy software in small and mid practice. So this is most uh, more of a uh, small animal clinical orientation and the advancements in uh, computerized radiography and how it is applicable to small animal practice, uh, particularly uh, cardiovascular and orthopedic surgery. So the advancements in imaging techniques uh, is enormous uh, since the last one decade. And uh, now the imaging is uh, a decade back and imaging today is uh, uncomparable. Uh, now we are able to see and we are able to measure things which were not possible uh, some uh, 10 years back. And uh, these advancements in medical science have been adopted uh, and uh, changed according to the veterinary uh, requirements. And now we are on par uh, with the human medicine where uh, we are using digital radiography, computerized radiography, MRI and CT scan in uh, at least uh, uh, certain uh, pockets of India. So now I would like to talk on computerized radiography, how it changes the uh, imaging techniques in small animal practice and uh, how was the computerized the normal radiography uh, some few years back and now the computerized version of the radiography has enormously increased our uh, method of diagnosing the condition. Uh, it has helped the surgeons to accurately calculate pre-operatively uh, certain angles and certain measurements and which are not possible uh, under conventional radiography. Conventional radiography is where we used to take a uh, exposure on a normal film and where we process the film uh, by liquid processing and that was the only uh, uh, method of diagnosing the lesion. Uh, when we enter into computerized uh, radiography, it, is, it has entirely changed the, the way we uh, interpret the radiograph. Uh, uh, now it is very hard to miss a lesion on a computer radiography. The reason being, uh, the radiographs are so crystal clear that as if you are looking into the organ. So when you take an abdominal radiography, you can uh, visualize the kidneys, visualize the skin, visualize the uterus, visualize the uh, intestines separately, as if we are open the abdomen and visualizing the skin. So such is the clarity and such is the uh, pixel quality of the image where we can change the uh, contrast, we can change the brightness, we can highlight one particular part of the whole x-ray without distortion of the image. That is the uh, basic uh, highlight of computer radiography. And in this topic, we try to uh, overall uh, have a view on overall view of how the computer radiography has changed modern day imaging procedures 
and how this computerized data can be inbuilt software mechanism can be used uh, for diagnosing various clinical conditions both in cardiovascular and orthopedic patients so digital radiography it is a form of x ray imaging where digital x ray sensors are used instead of a traditional photography so this was uh, uh, hardly possible some 10 years back uh, where we used to use only traditional photographic film which gets exposed to an x-ray and then we use the process and it, this computerized or digital radiography is one of two parts the two may be the computer radiography and direct digital radiography in a computer radiography we use an imaging plate uh, to record the image and the which is stored in a cassette coated with phosphorus crystal and when we expose the patient by keeping the patient or part to be x-ray over the cassette and expose it to the x-ray uh, this x-ray strike the imaging and the, the electrons in the crystals are anesthetized to a very higher form forming the latent so now the latent image gets trapped in the cassette until we feed it to a computerized scanner where this latent image will be converted into a digital image so it requires a special plate reader in which the cassette is placed once the cassette is placed in the reader or we call it or we also call it scanner the film will be uh, removed from the cassette and it will be scanned to uh, whatever the image is stored after the exposure and during the cassette uh, during the scanning of the cassette the high state electrons are released into a lower state and that stimulates phosphorus so now the scanner um, imaging system will scan this uh, stimulated phosphorescence and the light produced is detected and converted into an electronic signal and into a digital signal which is then transferred to our computer and then the data need to be displayed so similar uh, the advantage of the existing uh, different uh, computer based radiography or cr what we call is the similar screen structure to film screen we have used to use in the photography like light emitting phosphorus crystal and the cassettes now which we are using are reusable plates suppose for example you take an exposure feed it to a scanner the image will be transferred or digitized and will be transferred to the computer then it can be stored in a computer permanently for generations together and now the cassette or whatever cassette uh, which we have used for the exposure Will the image will be deleted immediately, and the cassette will be ready to use for the another exposure. So with these cassettes will last for several years, and the biggest advantage is these cassettes with the digital radiography can be used with the already existing exposition, uh, like tabletop or PC. Either can be used on tabletop or on PC. So already existing X-ray machine. can be used along with this cassettes to produce a digital so that is the thing for whoever want to establish a computer radiography need not think about an extra machine what because if they are already have an existing what they have to think about is the processing mechanism where it should be digitalized if you prefer a computer so nowadays we are getting such a compact computer radiography consoles where the cassette is set into a scanner and immediately the image is transferred to the so in nowadays we are also getting uh, advanced with uh, digital direct digital radiography where the image plate is uh, directly built into an x-ray table which is a portable table which can be carried to any place particularly uh, by uh, using uh, the practitioners uh, imaging Especially in hospitals, if you want to take the machine from one ward to another ward, from one place to another, so this is mobile. You can carry, and directly the cassette is uh, directed to one place. It is taken the cassette is attached, and without any scanning process, like in computerized radiography, the image will be directly focused on the computer screen, and the electrical pulse is immediately digitalized. So that you get further advancement. as direct digital radiography now the processing uh, part of this is the digital data in the computer is evaluated 
uh, manipulated according to the vendor specific software. For example, vendor specific uh, vendor specific software is the one which will be provided by the uh, company manufacturing the computerized vehicles. For example, uh, in the whole level we have uh, Spring, uh, they are the pioneers we have QB company, we have Kodak, we have DE company, units, human. So these are vendor specific software are available, and these uh, software nowadays we are even taking veterinary specific software. In our veterinary specific software, we have options for canine, feline, bovine, equine, uh, laboratory animals, small mammals, and even uh, exotic food. So the software is inbuilt in this, uh, and the vendor space defines a specific algorithm on the basis of the body mechanism. Suppose you want to take a thoracic radical or an abdominal radical. So there are uh, algorithms fixed uh, with this software. And they define the contrast and resolution and optical. So the computer forms an image histogram, which is compared to an ideal histogram, and which is uh, specified for the particular processing algorithm. So the image quality, what you get after uh, using this computer radiography, depends on position. This, this is a patient positioning is even if it is a conventional radiography, even if it is MRI, if it is a CT scan, the positional patient position should be perfect. The angle of the beam, the pixel size which we are using, magnification. And as I said, major the major advantage is even if you magnify the image many times, the pixels will not be damaged in this radiography. And try to have a maximum collimation so that the organ of interest or the area of interest only should be exposed for X-ray. And it also depends on your computer monitor. The higher resolution monitor should have a high resolution. So the, there are certain specific advantages of the, uh, the image you get from a digital radiography. The number one is the image can be adjusted after exposure. See, exposure, the, the different stages of getting the quality radiograph that is used for the perfect diagnosis. Number one is patient position. Number two is the factors which we use on And number three is the process. These three aspects of image processing can alter the final outcome of the radiograph. So patient positioning, of course, it is in our hands. So we can write the patient position. Number two, factors of an X-ray machine is again in our hands because we can fix the factors according to the uh, chart, technique chart of the X-ray machine. And the final processing which the uh, CR does for us uh, can be adjusted even after, suppose any uh, Exposure factors are uh, not up to the mark. The advantage of the CR is you can change the quality of the image based on the vendor specific software provided by the vendor. So, that, that what happens because of the uh, adjustable software is there is no need to retake. Uh, the retakes are minimal. Retake means again, we, have, we need not subject the patient for another x ray. So that what happens, the uh, exposure factors to the uh, patient are minimized, the exposure, exposure to the attendant of the patient is minimized. So even with a single exposure, we can get the quality diagnostic radiography. And computer manipulation of the digital image is possible. And you can see even a soft tissue or a bony detail in a single image. That is an advantage. And study shows that digital films are equal or far better than the traditional uh, for evaluation or visualizing most of the problems. So in this image, uh, or a digital image, uh, the, uh, the why we should digitalize the image is the archiving the digital format so that if there is a lot of space saving, we will not have uh, columns of uh, processor fillings because they are stored in computer for, uh, forever. Allow manipulation of the image and uh, so you can see in this uh, figure the image only one part of uh, the image was highlighted and so this part of the image was highlighted uh, from the base major image and this was not distorted and you can see a very 
uh, highlighted image very clearly the detailed parts of the bone pathway. See, it improves the efficiency of the diagnosis and less exposure to our technicians, as I said, repeat radiographs are minimized because of this processing unit. And the digitized images are, can send to Ethernet or Ethernet. Ethernet, when suppose in a big hospital, you have different wards. Uh, the image taken in a radiology unit can be sent to a medicine ward. Image taken in a radiology unit can be sent to a scanning ward. It can be sent to a theater. It can be sent to a soft tissue theater or an orthopedic theater. Where it's the only thing you should have a monitor. And the image taken somewhere in radiology, it can be visualized in the theater itself. So any intraoperative modifications that will be done or intraoperative uh, checkups you should take while doing a surgery is possible, which was not possible with the conventional radiograph. And the biggest advantage is no chemical uh, needed for visualizing the radiograph. Earlier, the chemicals which we use in a normal uh, processing radiographic film are highly toxic. And the people who are in regular contact with these chemicals always had many biological side effects. So it reduces the time to produce the image, reduces the time for retakes, reduces the time for processing, and reduces the time to label and store the image is very, very, very minimal. The moment the image is processed in an X-ray, it is ready for storage. So it is stored in the computer, so no difficult storage. Quick access. Only thing is, you give the reference number. Even the X ray taken from one year back, in within seconds, it can be seen from a physical X ray. And you can transfer the image to other multimedia um, platforms, like you can do a CD writing, you can send it to a USB pen uh, drive, you can send it to the internet, you can prepare uh, for a class by downloading these images, you can do an undergraduate teaching, you can do a Postgraduate research and the field of the uh, original country. So, this is how a digital image, the figure here will show archiving the uh, picture archive and communication system uh, where these images can be sent to different formats of uh, within the hospital or from one hospital to another hospital or suppose it's a repeating image from one college to another college. So, a person sitting at one place can take the class on the radiology uh, to students of two to three classes uh, connected to the internet using these digital images. So cost savings overall initial cost is higher of course for the establishing the digital radiography but due to saving of time and material uh, it can uh, actually cheaper in long term because maintenance cost here we, we are not purchasing any film we are not purchasing any chemicals these chemicals are usually very short life, uh, conventional radiography, we are not at all purchasing those because the cassettes which I have uh, discussed are reusable ones in the standard company. Digital image will improve the quality uh, and comparison of previous radiography is here because you already have the image in the computer and you can compare the radiograph with the previous image and there is no uh, worry about this case. So, few uh, disadvantages like uh, the training and learning curve is high so for a, and we should have had a good quality of the training. Initial cost is high compared with the and uh, other technological costs associated with the computer as well as you know, that they will have to be But once it is set up and it is a lifelong maintenance free so the figure is about even a single person with a hospital can be managed because it is all So see the difference between how a normal traditional I try to see certain software based calculations uh, in the computer radiography and how they are having their clinical importance. And we will try to see certain cardiovascular and uh, orthopedic procedures of calculating software based calculations of these 
parameters which are helpful for a clinician uh, for a diagnosis or for planning for the surgery. So in this aspect, we will try to discuss about the cardiothoracic ratio and the vertebral cord score, what is called the VHS, normal angle for the hip dysplasia, which comes under the orthopedic procedure, and the uh, feeble plate leveling osteotomy measurements, how a orthopedician can plan uh, of leveling and a feeble plate to base on the PR uh, measurements, and TTH, feeble and feeble fibrosity advancement measurements, how is the operation will come to a conclusion how much advancement should be made and finally the prostatic measurements, uh, particularly in male uh, pediatric patients where a measurement of prostate uh, also is very important for a clinician to come to a conclusion whether prostate is enlarged or not. So first we take up the cardiothoracic ratio uh, which was computed as the percentage area of cardiac select relative to the area of the thorax. This is how we take a ratio of cardiac and thorax ratio. And these measurements were uh, performed using a digitalized software program, as I said, which is inbuilt in a digital radiography. And a lateral and ventodorsal radiography is the point of peak inspiration and expiration for diagnosing. So the ultimate uh, diagnosis of computing a cardiothoracic ratio by calculating cardiothoracic ratio we will come to know whether the animal is suffering from cardiomegaly or microcardia. Microcardia is shrunken heart uh, seen in second condition. So these are normal CPR values in a male, uh, female uh, normal CPR, the cardiac value should be around 0.48 if it is a male dog and about 0.5 if it is a female dog. And on average, we take it as 0.49. So in this video, uh, we will see uh, now see this is the metadorsal view of the heart and this is the outline of the heart and the maximum width of the heart should be pointed followed by the maximum area of the thoracic width and the then the software will automatically calculate the cardiac ratio and in this particular case it was at 0.6 if the ratio was 0.6 so we can suspect for mild cardiac daily because uh, we have seen that the average CTR ratio should be around 0.49 so it is in this particular case it was around 0.6 so it could be a mild case of cardiac daily. so this was the cardiac thoracic ratio and important and for next uh, another measurement of heart is we call it a vertebral heart score where the length of long and short axis of the heart is measured with respect to the length of the vertebral cord. So here we are measuring the heart in respect to the uh, vertebral body width. So the same animal vertebral body width can be taken and usually normal vertebral heart score of the dog will be around 9.7 vertebra and as 95% of normal brain population it will fall around from 8.7 to 10.7 vertebral body length. And so this is the lateral radiograph of the heart, and this is how we measure with simple software the vertebral heart score in the heart. Starting from the this is carina, the trachea, the base of the heart, the apex of the heart, and we start from the carina to the apex of the heart. The maximum length of the heart will be measured, followed by this is a stepwise calculation of VHS, how the software we calculate. Followed by we the second step will be calculating the maximum width of the heart and the third step will be calculating the width of the fourth thoracic vertebra. So these are the thoracic vertebra. We count the fourth number one, two, three, four, and the width of fourth vertebra will be calculated. And immediately after the four steps, the software will give the vertebral heart score. Based on that, we can diagnose the cardiomegaly or uh, the skin condition. So now this is a uh, video uh, which will tell you how to make the vertebral software page. So the first click here we can see we are measuring the maximum length of the uh, vertical part of the heart and the width of the heart and fourth vertebra will be measured the width and automatically now we got here the vertebral heart score as level point four which level point four is the vertebral heart score of the Heart. So it is uh, slightly above that. Oh. Now 
this is another video uh, you can see the data graph the parts are dilated and complete and now we are going to do it now we are measuring the weight for the both of the photograph now here the variation is around 14 points and which indicates that is the heart is severely dilated now coming to the orthopedic applications of this, uh, one aspect where we can use this is uh, the dysplasia where there is the laxity of the coxofemoral joint leading to improper development and the changes and uh, the signs can be mild to severe, it can be presented as a limited condition or a condition. So this is how we visualize the hip joint on the normal data graph and this is the head of the femur, neck of the femur and this is the and usually, we can also, with the help of the computer radiography, we can do the measurements of the width of the head, head of the femur, and the uh, width of the neck of the femur. And as a uh, condition, the width of head should be always less than the width of the neck of the femur, which can be calculated on the display. Now, see the abnormality of a, a dysplastic dog with the degenerative changes and the normal dog. Uh, with the normal hip joint. Uh, now this is how we measure a, a normal angle, which is a very very important factor in determining the uh, dog uh, affected with the hip dysplasia. So normal angle is measured. So this is the view of the pelvis should be taken on the CD pelvis, and the head center of the head of the one of the femur should be taken. And the entire uh, femoral head should be covered, and the cradle most part of the spine should be split here. And the same procedure should be followed on the other joint, and automatically the software will calculate the angle of the normal angle as 120. In this particular form, it is 120. But uh, in a slight, um, this is, these are the measurements. Uh, my dysplasia is above 110 is considered as normal. And as the normal angle decreases, uh, the chances of developing hip dysplasia increases. So, in a severe hip dysplasia, the angle may go down less than 90 degrees. Now, the here it is near around 110. In a severe hip dysplasia, dysplasia it may go down below 90. So, this is a very, very important parameter for deciding the orthopedic person to deciding whether the dog is going to go hip dysplasia or not. not measuring a normal angle based on completion. So normally it is around 105, Labrador will be around 99 or 100, dot pillars will be played on different teeth, retrievers will be five pillars, 92, and German Shepherds will be around 100. So in this particular uh, bilateral, this is the bilateral case of a severe hip dysplasia and with severe subluxation of head of the femur out of the scabulum. And measuring the normal angle in such cases will be highly useful. It will also act as a prognostic factor to, to tell to the owner the outcome of surgical procedure because of these normal angles to the owner. Now, this is how to measure the normal angle. This is the pelvic degree of a normal dog. Now, you have to pick one point on the center of the head of the femur of one pelvic joint. Now, back the cursor so that the head of the femur is covered and the tip of the spine. So, in this dog, the normal angle of both is around 104. So, it is within the normal average. Thank you. And in another video, we will see the measurement of normal
next is but all cases of cruciate ligament rupture or failure to shield or solid cruciate ligament rupture, the tibial plateau angle may be important. Again, okay. The tibial plateau angle is nothing but an angle between the line perpendicular to the long term to the to the line perpendicular. So this is the tibial plateau. The more the angle of the tibial plateau, the chances of cruciate rupture will be more. So an orthopedician will look, or you should always look towards the tibial plateau angle. When he is uh, dealing with the cruciate ligament rupture uh, cases, so the measurement based on uh, computerized radiography is very important. So usually it should be in the range of 23 to 28, uh, the tibial uh, plateau angle of various waves of rock, and the usual range is around 12 to 15 angles. Now this is important. So uh, by measuring this, uh, for example, this dog is showing around 30, and see the level of the tibial plateau. So now to do a tibial plateau leveling of ligaments, which is there, if you measure this, you can come to a conclusion as a surgeon, how much uh, leveling of ligaments is to be done in this particular dog to attain a normal tibial plateau and to prevent the crucial structure. Now this is how an osteotomy is post operative step, and this is how uh, I made it by leveling. Initially it was inclined like this, the tibial plateau. Now it has to be very flat and so that the cruciate structure the chances will be reduced and the content of the bone is fixed at the plate of the leg. So this is how the step by step can happen. So this is how this is after making cut the osteoarthritis saw and you deviate the head of the tibia as after uh, fixing it. Now the level is the fibre plate to the level. You now see compare it with the level initially before operative. And now see this level, now it will be plain and now it will be fixed with the Now this is the EPO proposal, the people that you have been Now this is a pre-operative uh, inclination of people to do after surgery. Now this is how the software will help us to determine the level of the So the software, there are two software. Now the cranial most part of the tibial plateau, the most part of the tibial plateau is pointed, and the highest prominence of the tibia in the joint, and the distal most uh, part of the tibia is the metaphysical muscles, and automatically your software will tell you, and then and according to the application, they go for the tibial plateau level. And next is TTA. TTA is also for cruciate structures, and the here it is. The type of surgery is different. What we do is we advance the anterior tibial fibrosis. The measurement you make on a digital software radiography, and this, uh, this uh, software will tell you how much advancement of tibial tissue should be done so that the two shapes are not ruptured. So, this is called tibial, uh, tibial transposition, uh, tibial fibrosity transposition. Now, see, this is the measurement of. Tibial fibrosity angle. Now, this mm -hmm. point made on the distal end of the femoral condyle and head condyle has been covered in the second step. Now, the femoral proximal point has been covered in the second The third step is the radial most part of the lateral line. Fourth is the radial most part of the feet. So, now this okay. will automatically tell you that it is around 15 and 13. The tibial transposition should be done. To the rate of 15 and Dr. Vagnath. Okay. Yes, sir. This is the last. Doctor, please, please conclude. Hmm? Please. And now, the, uh, finally, the prostate enlargement is again the uh, consideration in adult animals where many animals are subject to this menstruation problem. So, we should be uh, suspect for a prostate enlargement. And measuring the prostate, quantifying the measurement of the prostate is very easy when you have this. You will see, uh, now these are different conditions of prostate. It can be prostate myelia, it can be vitrinopathy, it can be prostate cyst. The different conditions can be permitted. So, now in this x ray, you can see that this is a huge soft tissue structure. This is nothing but the abnormally extended prostate. But quantifying the quantity of the measurement of the prostate can be done with the software based uh, x ray. Now, this is an x ray, uh, black abnormal x ray. So, this is uh, what you have to do is uh, try to measure the maximum width and maximum length of the prostate length, then measure the length from the uh, sacrum to the gluteal prominence. So, uh, you get these measurements, and when I 
either length or width of prostate should be less than 70% of the circumflex point. So anything greater than that, you can directly consider it as a prostatic tumor. So this is the advantage of the software. This is the application of certain software in cardiovascular, orthopedic, and abdominal surgery, where a surgeon can get a very quantitative idea of increase in the size or angle of this particular organ. And based on that, he can one plan the prognostic uh, factors. Number two, plan the surgical. Uh, so this was uh, what I want to highlight about the advantages of compressed visibility uh, in small Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raghunath. Uh, the for your valuable presentation on computerized radiography software application in small animal, small animal production, uh, that is a practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I, I now the talk. topic is op open for uh, uh, discussion. Is there any queries from the participants? Is there any questions from the participants? You can ask now. Sir, in YouTube, there is no question, sir. Okay. Okay, is there any question? You can also uh, put in the chat box. Thank you, Dr. Raghunath. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much for, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Venkat Seshaya, for chairing the session. And thank you, Dr. Nagamalika, for being the reporter. Mm. It was a fruitful session. All the six presenters uh, presented in their sequence, and all these varied topics. Uh, were of much uh, importance and I think they would they have been very much of use uh, to all the listeners. And uh, for the benefit of all, these are all uh, in our YouTube channel. They can be viewed uh, any number of times, anytime at your convenience. Uh, getting the benefit. Oh. And uh, we request you to view them if you have missed them. So this concludes the complete a technical program of the three days conference with the completion of the session six. And uh, we thank you all for being part of this uh, session six. And uh, we remind you that uh, the feedback link has been posted uh, in the chat box. Those desirous of having the e-participation certificate, uh, please uh, click the feedback link and give your uh, feedback. As we have said, five out of six feedbacks are needed for you to get a certificate. So thank you very much. And uh, I invite you all to be joining us back at uh, three o'clock sharp for the valedictory ceremony. The Animal Husbandry Commissioner Government of India is going to be the chief guest on the occasion. So thank you for... Uh, making this session and uh, because of your participation in the other sessions thank you for making this whole second national web conference on the advances in teaching and research in veterinary anatomy in india being hosted from 16th to 18th of december 2021 from the college of veterinary science gannavaram in the state of andhra pradesh under the ages of sri venkateswara Veterinary University. We invite you once again to the valedictory ceremony at 3 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you for giving the opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Thomer, please end the meeting. Yes, sir.